<coughs> yeah, see in the meeting, it says it's now streaming live, but here it says setting up your meeting for YouTube live. And I'll push record. We're live. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hope everyone's feeling well today. And I hope that, uh, you know, if you're in an area that's having hard times, that you're uh, having the strength that it takes to get through. And, and hopefully today we can cover some subjects that can give you a little inspiration in this time. Moving forward, we'll be able to cover some spiritual aspects of what's happening in life right now and some tools that we can work with. We're going to cover some practical herbalism and some um, gardening uh, tips and some, some things that you can find on walks. And we have a diverse group here today, which we're really excited about. Um, just want to give um, a, a special love to Marcus. Um, thank you so much for holding the space for us. We really appreciate you. <laughs> You're really special to us. You really hold the community together. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to have Terry Willard back today out from uh, Vancouver Island and his wonderful, beautiful partner, Alexandra, who is going to be with us today. And Daniel down in Mendocino from the Bryceland Forest Farm and Patricia from Sunroots down in the Covalo Valley. Wade Laughter, thanks so much for your kindness coming in from Grass Valley, California. We've got uh, Kenny up in Bellingham, Northern Washington, uh, giving us some love. Alexis out in Ontario um, with the, the Rebel Roots Herb Farm and the Organic Grow Canada. Uh, Canada and, uh, and our wonderful family members, uh, Brandon and Amanda, thank you so much for showing up with us today. We really appreciate you. Well, maybe you guys can, um, uh, so you know what we would like to do is we would like to start with Alexandra to give us uh, an opening um, in this, uh, in this uh, ceremony, this second DEM Pure Educational Series. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So at first I actually like to honor all of you as you sit here in front of this uh, screen I like to honor you while you are sitting right now uh, and, and all the different places of earth where you have your feet planted and the place and the land that you are living on. At the very most, I like to acknowledge the people that have walked before us on this very land that you live right now the life that is still present there, the life of the plant, the animal kingdom and the crawlers, the people that have come before us, your ancestors that have passed on the life to you, they have sacrificed maybe a lot so that we can live in peace. It is a interesting time but it is also important that we are acknowledging and honor in respect the people that have come before us and for a short moment i know that whoever comes in and sees that i want you to see yourself really grounded into the ground into the land just beneath your feet the land is there, it's for you. It supports us all the time. And the life supports us. And it does not, uh, includes everything. The life includes everything. And I, my hope is that we are including today everything, whether we judge or not judge. I'm giving my thanks to you here present in this form, the human form that you are sitting, uh, experiencing life as much as it is and presents itself to you. The beautiful thing is that wherever you are, when you open yourself, 
it can go into the land itself and whatever you give, it will return itself to you. I'm really honored to be part of this today and I thank you, uh, Kelly and Josh, for inviting me today. Um, and I, I'm sure that everyone here is on the same page in respect to life, uh, whatever comes. And uh, to promote that in the future, uh, I find that it's really important um, now, not just to gardening for this season or this spring, but actually to start to your gardening for now and the future. Meaning when you start seeding this spring, think about it, what you want to harvest on the end, uh, not just the cannabis, but also your vegetables. Many, many, many years ago, I was told to ensure that a lot of people know how to grow their own food. And so I have done that for the last 15 years. And the way how I done that, it's not just the organic, organic way, but also in the biodynamic way, which includes uh, everything, the whole solar system, the whole plant world. Um, it was, um, as you might know, done by um, Rudolf Steiner, who also is the founder of the Waldorf schools. It makes totally sense to me because uh, not just to plant after the moon, but actually to include all the solar system as we are part of the cosmos. Uh, we are on earth, absolutely, uh, but we are also part of the cosmos. And it is a giving and a receiving through this practice. Now I also, and I invite you all to actually see what works for you on your place. Everyone has a totally different environment and land. Um, and and um, the way also how you can grow it, you know, your our season starts in totally different times. So you got to see what works for you. And that includes also um, techniques, uh, garden techniques. I have tried many things and uh, the main thing is to actually connection to the plant itself, the connection to the land itself. So when you go out and you, before you start your garden, connect to the land. The best book you can ever buy or start reading is your garden itself because the plants will tell you what they need and what they don't. Just because it works for somebody on the East Coast, it doesn't work for somebody on the West Coast. So question you need to ask to the garden or to the plants and to your environment itself. I have not done totally biodynamic in the garden because uh, I was just by myself. So I took what works for me and left the rest without judging. I apply that also to life. Again, I like to um, encourage you to do the same. Take what really works for you and leave the rest. The same, I like to encourage you with your ancestors, the one that you came from. They have done, they have lived, and some of our ancestors have lived through a very harsh time I myself was born in East Germany behind the wall. So I grew up with uh, the communists on one side and the church on the other side. And I did not know any other way, but I just took what worked and, and left the rest. And that served me well, of course. Um, yeah, I think this um, is the most important thing that I can share today is to reach your garden, reach your plants. And um, when you seed, when you start your garden, don't seed at all, save your seeds and don't waste them because we are in panic. Um, just always a little bit and put all your heart into it and then again, plant again. Don't waste it all with... Um, sprouting you can grow a garden it doesn't have to be big 
but when you follow certain things which I did in the biodynamic as a calendar, the nutrition and the, the energy in the plants are actually very intense. So you don't need that much. You don't need a big bulb of, uh, of salad greens when they are full of vital life and the vital life you get, um, in my experience, through the following with the biodynamic calendar, but also at the time when you harvest. Harvest it in the morning when the energy is moving upwards from the earth into the plant parts and uh, then you harvest them. When you harvest your, your uh, root vegetables, you do that more in the afternoon because the energy is moving back into the earth. It's like a breath from earth going in and out. In that way, you have a high potency uh, vegetable. So in order to get the most out of it, I recommend that. And there's many other things that, uh, that you can follow uh, to have a most healthy uh, and potent food for you. And in the summer, we need more salads, yes. And in the winter, more, more uh, roots. So the season actually tells you already what your body really needs. Also your vegetables know what you need because you are growing it with your hands. You're growing it in your region. Uh, you're growing it on your land. The plants always work for you. Um, so that's, I think, is that good enough? Is that uh, short enough and sweet, I hope? Um, if there's any question. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful um, entry and a beautiful teaching and, and a reminder. Thank you so much. And I think so many people are, you know, really looking into gardening um, for yeah. the first time. You know, we're looking into sustainability. We're understanding that maybe, you know, uh, the grocery store may not have all mm -hmm. of the food that we need here in the near future. So I, I just, I love the way that you're looking at it, whatever works for you. And that's really beautiful. And that's a wonderful yeah. thing and message to the listeners out there. You know, not everybody is an, is an expert gardener, but we, we all have this connection to the earth. And wow, Alex, thank you so much Absolutely. for your opening. And, and the person you. who you are and the space that you're holding is just so beautiful. Terry, I would love to hear from you about, you know, traditional Chinese medicine and some helpful yeah. hints that we have for people. I, I want to start off by saying it's, it's significant for any of you out there that want to learn more about gardening. Alex, Alexandra puts on free courses in the evenings on this kind of stuff. And she also has a, a full course you can get off of her for very economical these days, just so you can expand that. And then she has a very active Instagram thing to be able to help work with that on a daily basis to know what you should be doing in each day. <clears throat> um, I'm a, my name is Terry Willard. Um, I'm a doctor of herbal medicine and I've been in clinical practice since 1975. I'm now retired. <clears throat> I've worked on almost every gamut that you can imagine of herbal medicine and wild plants, etc. But some of the things I want to talk about today is probably the most important thing I want to say is um, you've got this covered. We've all got this covered. We've worked for millennia on viruses and various plagues and stuff like this. This is not our first plague. We've already rehearsed this in many lifetimes in the past. You've got it. We can do it. And our body has to work with it just properly. There are many different aspects we can look at this. If you look around the world and the various models, interestingly enough, one of the best models for this comes from Chinese medicine, TCM, because they don't look at the immune system the same way we do. It's important to note in Wuhan and throughout China, over 80 to 90% of them were using botanical remedies along with modern medicine and, and respirators and stuff like that to be able to help clear it out of the body. They had a much higher success rate with the people who were using them. No, it didn't stop the virus. It actually helped get things out of the body, be able to clean the body and work on the symptoms because the virus itself doesn't necessarily kill you. It's the secondary symptoms that do it. So they would change the therapy as they go along. So it's not just a strong immune system or a weak system. They split it down into four levels. 
The first one is called Wei Chi. This is kind of like the ninja or the Jedi Chi. This is protective Chi. This is the block so you don't get the virus. You can do many things. Looking around and hearing where some of you come from, really a lot of us have got alder growing on our property at this point in time. And you can take the little catkins of alder and the little twigs, and we've made some today actually, um, to be an antiviral. It's a great antiviral and it will stop it. It's great for this way chi. It's defensive. It'll kill the virus so you don't get it. Echinacea is a very good example of this also. And also it's fermented buckthorn. These are all things that prevent it. But that's just working on the surface. If we want to work deeper into our system, we want to work on the way this way chi, yin chi, yang chi, and yang chi. Uh, the last two sound very similar. If you use the medicinal mushrooms, that'll protect you all the way through. So I'm a very, very strong believer in using the medicinal mushrooms. Probably the best one for this is turkey tail. Again, used very heavily um, in Asia. Reishi comes next, chaga, agaricon if you live in the Pacific Northwest. Some of you have it grown in your area. It's pretty hard to get other places. Um, cordyceps opens up the bronchial tubes, really helps that whole phenomena. Oh, I love the way you're doing this, Marcus. You're, you're, you're giving me a slideshow in the background. Great for you. But being able to work with this, there's the agaricon right there and Paul Stamet. But the idea of being able to use these for your immune system will not only nourish the chi inside you, be able to work with that. There's the chugga. And you're being able to protect yourself at the same time. If it starts getting into our lungs, we've got the sore throat, the smelling stop, the taste is stopped. You've got the sore throat and starting to go in. Then you want to look with the yin things. Then your elderberry syrup and things like that are excellent, excellent, excellent. And don't worry about all the stuff you're finding out about how some of these don't work because they got cytokine storms and stuff like that. That's all, lack of better words, fake news. Um, we can use, you can use ushnia. Um, I've been using colt's foot, astragalus, Ella Companion. These are all things to nourish the lungs and pour the mucus out. But some of the best things you can use is any kind of bulb. That would be garlic or the white part of green onions. Onions themselves would do that. Honey is really good because the mucus actually cakes in the lung and it can't come out. So the bulbs will move that. Honey moves that. Licorice moves that. So one of the most famous formulas for this is taking Ma Wong, Ephedra Seneca, and you mix that with licorice especially if you can coat it in honey and barbecue it, that works even better and put some bulbs in it. That will be able to pull this thing out of the lungs and drink these teas. Of course, bone broth will work with this. Um, medicinal broths will work with this. All of these things work really well. Again, our body and our immune system and our spirit and mind are tuned to these botanicals. We need to use this. This doesn't mean we stop Western medicine. Yeah, we still do the social distancing. We wash our hands. We do all the rest of the stuff. By doing these as adjuncts, we have a better chance of surviving. Reminding yourself, 80 to 90% who catch the virus only have mild symptoms. It doesn't bother them that much. It's only the elderly like myself typically do it. But we had a person in BC the other day that died at 30. So it does hit young people too. And hits the young people, they're just carriers. We have to watch this. But when I look at all of this, the most important thing is what Alexandra said, is grounding yourself in the earth with good food. Because what you want to do is you want to make sure you stop mucus forming foods as much as possible. So if you can reduce that as much as possible, that means you take out the dairy, you take out the flour, you take out the sweets, all of these things and large amounts of red meat, all of these things will form mucus in your body. And that's what we're trying to get rid of. Of course, it's a dry mucus, so you want to drink, 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 chai and stuff like that, maybe not with the dairy, but the cinnamon, the, the, the heating herbs will also move it all out in this way. But when you come around to this, it really reminds you, there's many prophecies that we've seen around the world on this. And I want to share one prophecy that I'm sure we've all heard of. I'm just going to go onto the screen share here and see if I can find this here. This is Prophecy Rock. Um, this Prophecy Rock, 
is, is Hopi prophecy rock. And you can see this is mankind here. And we're going along two paths. Some people go up this path or even this path here. These are the people that are living too much in their head and they're disconnected. Maybe they're doing that all on social media or something like this. These are the people that are following the thing. This dies. This one doesn't. These are the people that are working with their fields. They're tending their plants. They're still connected with nature. This is the path that the survivors should be traveling, meaning that we're going through a big reset. Some of that's economical, some of that's emotional, some of it's spiritual. But if we can keep ourselves grounded, may that be the medicinal mushrooms, may that be our meditation, may that be going for walks in the woods or getting your hands in the soil and working that through, all of these are very beneficial. These ones who are in their head are not so successful. So we might have a whole bunch of people going down that tube way to be able to help it. Um, I'm also very, very strong on masking. I know CDD, CDC said that masking wasn't good, but if you look at the maps of the people that did mask, their success rate is way, way better than the people that aren't masking. I spent a lot of time in Asia and people mask an awful lot around there. But again, our biggest thing, don't fear this. We've dealt with this kind of thing, keep calm. But in saying that, welcome to the Hunger Games. We are having a thing going on right now, which is right out of the Hunger Games. Most of us are just spectators. We can't tell what the big boys and girls are doing out there. We don't know what they're doing. We don't need to get into conspiracy theories. The point is, there's other people out there that are trying to manipulate the world when we're in these chaos states. So make sure you don't let your social liberties be ruined during this period of time and keep calm, keep to the ground. And well, the pioneer mind right now makes an awful lot of sense. So we talk about the immune system at the different levels, at different stage, the echinaceas for Wei Qi and the vitamin C for Wei Qi, that's not gonna work soon it gets into your lungs. You can stop those and go into the deeper things especially the medicinal mushrooms. And I'm going to stop there or I'll just ramble on forever, which I'm famous for doing. And I'll, I'll drop in whenever um, something seems relevant over the next little while. But I really want to make sure that we understand that, yes, we're spectators in the Hunger Game, but we've got this handled. We've been dealing with this for millennia. This is something that's part of our genetic code, and it's certainly part of our ancestral code. I really appreciate that perspective. You're a true gem to humanity. And I really appreciate the way you tell the story and deliver the message. It's, it's a, you're a wonderful person. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. And, and anybody who's interested, we're going to keep talking with Terry throughout this, but um, you know, he's running Wild Rose College, unbelievable amounts of information on the herbal front. You know, just recently I've really heard that, uh, you know, pharmaceutical are are called you know the fake the fake herbal remedies and so so much of what we see in pharmaceuticals you know comes from nature it, it comes from the earth it, it 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 is nature's pharmacy and then, and they've just you know synthesized it or concentrated in a way that maybe our body can't totally understand so you know it is up to us to start going back to nature and having an understanding of the, a lot of those medicines that you just mentioned and things that we can easily access, really, you know. And, you know, I really want to hear from everyone, but, and I think you kind of touched on this, but would you mind just saying really quickly what your thoughts were on just, you know, getting a natural immunity to something, you know, we, we have talked about this a little bit on the thing, but, you know, is it the importance of us as a humanity, as a human race to be able to get that, you know, what, what's your thought on that? I think the best way to get a natural immunity is walk outside in your forest. It doesn't matter if you're a cliff dweller in an apartment in downtown New York. Uh, that's still a phenomenon. You can get back to nature, just go out in your balcony and sing to the birds. They're still functioning and stuff like that. Remember that the best way for to get our immunity is ground. Big supporter of soups and stews and stuff for doing that. So really grounding ourselves in our food our meditation processes and doing that's the best. Then comes the medicinal mushrooms. And then it's staying away from the junk food. Those are the biggest things. Whole food, healing with whole foods. Absolutely. Paul Pitchford, give thanks. And I love it, Terry, you said grounding and that's just so important. Sasha, so great to see you today. We have our really good friend Sasha Cuff on today and 
Um, Sasha, I'd really love for you to tell everybody, you know, what you've been up to. When I think of the most amazing grounding person and somebody who's touched my heart on such a deep level, you know, I think of, I think of you, Sash, and, and um, you know, you've really helped guide us in for so many years, and I'm so glad to see you here today. What are you up to? And, you know, people are sort of freaking out. How, how can we be, be helpful to them? What are some pers time? perspectives on this time? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, for inviting me to be part of this. I really am happy to be here and to see everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have a ton to say, but I could talk a little bit. Uh, mostly what I've been doing the past five years is uh, psychedelic therapy, uh, mainly somatic psychedelic therapy. So the, I've really noticed that uh, the deepest healing seems to happen when we're embodied, when we're actually, our consciousness, our spirit is actually landed in this physical, third dimensional, you know, form. And what prevents us from really inhabiting uh, this body is unprocessed uh, emotional pain and unprocessed trauma. And <clears throat> what tends to happen is we dissociate from those pains and you know, a lot of us go into the left brain, just the thinking mind, and we, we, we try and figure everything out through, you know, deduction and reason and, and you know, making stories and having beliefs about things. And um, the problem with that is that we, you t when you're not embodied uh, and you're more navigating the world through, through thinking mind, uh, you lose your intuition and you lose your truth meter, you know, or what some people might call your bullshit detector. You know, when I notice when I'm really landed and I'm home and I'm here and, and I'm feeling the felt sense, there can be a newscast on or whatever, and I can feel right away, oh, that's bullshit. You know, my body starts to like cringe, you know. So um, one thing I've noticed in these times is there's just an onslaught of information, you know, and we're all sort of wading through it, trying to figure out, oh, my computer's beeping, sorry. Uh, what's true, you know, what's real, what's true. And, you know, we're kind of, well, this is a logical argument and this makes sense and there's evidence to back this up. And um, one of the problems is that, uh, what I've noticed is that most of the media are, they, they kind of take what the World Health Organization is saying and then just repeat it all over through their different outlets around the world. And, you know, the World Health Organization is, is a Rockefeller Foundation. It's, uh, if you research the president, like you find all this corruption. And, and what I've noticed is that the World Health Organization statistics are, tend to always come in about 35% higher than um, in, from independent sources. So it's creating this fear uh, where they're, they're, it, it's making the virus out to be much worse than it actually is because of the whole, you know, background agenda, of, you know, 5G and all these different, you know, just basically getting more of a stranglehold on and control over humanity. Uh, so what's, what I find the most important thing in these times is to, is to be able to feel what's real and what's true and what isn't true um, <clears throat> because there's so much misinformation that's just being pumped you know to the masses daily and it's creating this mass fear and mass hysteria and um, if you're not home or you're not landed in your body it, it's easy to get caught up in all that and kind of like oh my god um, start freaking out uh, <clears throat> so where psychedelics come in is they, they're this uh, beautiful tool when used in the right environment with the right intention to actually help you go into your pain, into your pain body, into your trauma, into your, especially the empathogens like MDMA or 3MMC and 2CB a little bit. Uh, but that capacity to actually draw your interoception, they call it interoception, that ability to sense and feel your sensations and your, your inner world. <clears throat> um, so in a properly, you know, guided 
session with, with the right medicines, you can really go into those, those old pains, those old traumas and actually start to release, you know, you're coughing it out, you're twitching, you're vibrating, you're like, ah, you know, just digging out that, all that old crap because the, the bitch about trauma is it might've happened like 50 years ago, but if it's unresolved, it's, it's, it's like a loop stuck in time. So it's still there. And, and there's, a, there's an epidemic that's actually at the root of pretty much all addiction and mental health disorders um, that they call developmental trauma. And the, the biggest form of developmental trauma is basically not being held enough as, a, as, a, as an infant and all the way through your life, but particularly, and so I'll, in North America, you know, we're in strollers, we're in car seats, we're in <coughs> um, cribs. And so a lot of us have this really early imprint of like, no one's coming and, and you know, and you, you'll hear a baby if they're crying, it's like, ah, 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 and then they'll stop. <clears throat> and you know, the cried out method, oh, look, it worked, they stopped crying. And, but they didn't self-soothe themselves. They went into like a play dead, you know, neural state of, of freeze. <clears throat> and those imprints stay in your system <clears throat> and they tend to cause uh, depression, uh, in those the shutdowns because they're looping in there or or there's this hyper arousal of, of unprocessed nervous energy where you're just like going all the time and you can't stop and you just got to keep doing stuff because if you stop you'll like Wah! freak out so the main thing that I'm trying to teach therapists actually is is touch because what was missing in those early imprints was being held being <clears throat> and when you take a psychedelic it makes you more um, neuroplastic. So what you do when you're on the medicine has a much deeper impact than it normally would. So you can kind of be strategic about that and go, okay, we're going to be more neuroplastic. You know, what was missing in, in those childhood imprints and then actually going into the fear and the, the terror and the, the freezes and the shutdown, but then doing something different, being held, being loved, being, you know, adored, being touched being like you know act getting and then as those imprints resolve it starts to get much more comfortable in the body <clears throat> um and then the other awesome thing about like a psychedelic session that's say seven hours long is you can go like layer by layer by layer by layer and get down to those core because not being held enough it always leaves this imprint of i'm not worthy i'm a burden I don't matter. Um, and they tend to be like thoughts or beliefs in the in our thought process, but they're actually coming from the this this these neural states. <clears throat> and we're trying to like undo it in our head and say affirmations. And but if you actually don't go into the, the terror and be and get held in that and <laughs> you know release it, <clears throat> um, you're gonna you're it doesn't matter how many affirmations you say, you're not, you're still going to think you're worthless or, or unworthy. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, as it gets, as you resolve the, the you know, release the energy out of the pain body, it gets more comfortable to, to be in, in the body. And then we all have this built in organic truth meter that's able to discern and feel what's true and what isn't. And with this virus, it's been really helpful to, to go, okay, like read the statistics or whatever and, and then feel into it and go, okay, well, that's not true. And um, <clears throat> what is actually true? And then start to find the actual information. Like the gestation period is only like four or five days. It's not two weeks. You know, a lot of people are spending two weeks holed up for, for no reason because they're, they're just misinformation. <clears throat> So my prayer is that more and more people will start to turn inward and, and actually start to face all the shadow elements, you know, because uh, there's a lot of spiritual bypass going on. And, but, you know, as you start to turn towards the shadow and resolve it, it starts to build all this capacity to, to love and to, uh, to show up with a solid nervous system that can actually help other people's nervous systems, like learn how to self-regulate and, and it starts to ripple out into their lives. And, and then you can self-soothe because when there's all this like hype and everything, 
if, if you're not good at um, self-regulating, then it's really easy to like spin out into, into fear and, and terror and, and all of those things. So the more you can turn towards the shadow and feel it and process it and be held in that, and psychedelics can really help with that, uh, the easier it is to self-regulate. And then, and then you're thinking clearly. You're, when horrible, scary information comes in, you don't go into a, a fear state. You, you can be like, okay, well, that's, that's challenging. I wonder what we can do about it. And then you tend to make rational, wise decisions because you're coming from a grounded, embodied place rather than uh, a dysregulated fear uh, nervous system. I, I love it. Yeah, so helpful, Sash. I think that- It's almost like the earthing that Terry was talking about is similar to the being held, the grounding, you know, that comforted holding, you know, it's like the earth holds you, but then also the spiritual holding too. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You can, yeah, if you have a good connection with the earth, it can help hold that pain and help you release it or your spirit guides or whatever and other humans and you bring all of those in and then you can really, you know, process a lot of shit and 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 start to stabilize your yourself in this embodied you know being yeah sash you know a lot of people are um you know th there's a lot of amazing hype and people are talking about micro dosing right now i know that you know it, it's hitting regular households it's hitting suburbia you know soccer moms are out there micro dosing you know, is there anything that you can talk about, in, you know, in microdosing that maybe be helping people in getting into that, you know, uh, authentic self and into our body? And people talk about set and setting and maybe, you know, since we're at our home, this is a time to create a temple in our home and, and, mm -hmm. and, and go into those places. I feel like this is a great awakening that we're having right now and it's an opportunity for us. So, you know, maybe a quick, quick thing of like, you know, do you um, recommend every day, every other day with certain herbs? Yeah, I mean, microdosing is definitely, uh, it works well for some people. It depends on what you're, you know, a lot of people, they read it and then like, oh, that's going to work forever. You know, it's going to be sort of a panacea for everything. But, you know, if you've got a lot of unprocessed anxiety in your system and you start microdosing mushrooms, um, it's actually going to make your anxiety, it can make it worse instead of, so there's really a, you know, really researching which medicines actually are applied to your particular, um, you know, diagnosis or state that you're trying to, to change, you know, like their mushrooms are great for getting out of those like shut down neural states and, 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 uh, <clears throat> depression and, The other thing is, yeah, they, you can, you know, with intention, um, even on a micro dose, you know, like you're saying, I love your idea of like make, you know, this, we can't go out or not everyone's going outside or we've got a lot more inside time. So what a perfect opportunity to actually go inside, you know, inside. Um, and, you know, to start, I'd love to do a little just short, uh, you know, two minute meditation if you guys are open to it and uh, just Let's to kind of get a taste of Let's what I'm talking it. about. Okay. Let's do it. <clears throat> so the mind is very fast and the body, the sensing, sensory motor is, well, they say seven times slower than the thought process. So the first step in this you know, looking within is a slowing down, you know, a pausing. And you might notice as you pause or stop that awareness actually naturally wants to start to sink down out of your head, you know, and thoughts might be there it's really important that you think about this right now. And instead of fighting with your mind and trying to make it shut up, it, I found it way more effective to just, just don't give it so much importance. You know, like, oh, we can get back to that later. <clears throat> so if thoughts are there, it doesn't matter. You just, just don't buy into them as much as possible. You know, they're trying to hook your awareness and 
instead of fighting them, you just kind of let them be. You just kind of don't give them as much importance. And then one of the most uh, helpful meditation instruction that I ever received was to relax, to relax, you know, to let go. And then as you relax, you know, you're not paying as much attention to thought, you start noticing that, oh, wow, there's a body here. There's, there's the senses. And this body is breathing. And as you just notice that, you know, you're not trying to change anything or create a certain state. You're just noticing what's naturally present now in the moment without any judgment. Might be tension, might be openness, might be pain, you know, might be blank in your body. There's no right or wrong, but just cultivating this curiosity. What happens when I kind of ignore the thoughts for a few minutes and just allow awareness to start to sink down out of my head into the felt sense. And it can almost feel like gravity is, is pulling your awareness kind of down your neck and into your shoulders. And, and then just noticing body sensations, whatever tension might be relaxed, might be open and just hanging out, you know, in somatic therapy, they have this principle of energy follows awareness. So wherever you put your awareness, the stuff starts to happen. So if there's a tension, say somewhere in your body as you're kind of scanning awareness through, you know, you can just kind of be curious and let your attention rest on that tension without any agenda, but just as an experiment to, okay, well, what happens if I just keep paying? It's uncomfortable. I don't like it but you just keep paying attention to it anyways. Part of the practice is learning to stay present with discomfort. So often as we feel that discomfort, there'll be a natural tendency to want to like jump back into the head or out of our bodies or wherever. And you, you know, if that happens, you just, oh, okay, yeah, let's bring it back. Oh yeah, it's uncomfortable. You know, what happens if I just kind of stay with it and, and Often it's almost like, it's like you're holding space for a, a child that's disgruntled, you know? You don't wanna rush them. You don't wanna like start trying to fix it. You know, you just show up in this present, patient, loving, loving way. And it's one thing I found with psychedelic therapy too is, is it's the, it's your presence that's the most important thing. You're, you're, that you're there with them in it together and that it's two humans. There's no expert. We're just here to support each other with whatever comes up. And so you can bring that same attitude into your inner children, your inner tension, your inner pain. Just this patient, and sometimes it can even help to put your hand on the on the spots that feel uncomfortable, just kind of as a, as a like, okay, we got you, we're here with you, we got time. And, and we're present for whatever it is, doesn't matter how dark, how gnarly, how much shame or fear or doubt is in there. We just continue to bring this patient, loving presence to it. And the body's so intelligent. It's like, you know, if we cut ourselves, as long as we keep it clean, you know, it heals itself. We don't have to keep like, okay, we've got to make sure that cell goes over top of that cell. You know, if you create the right conditions, the body starts just heals itself. So likewise with, with your psychology or your um, nervous system, if you create the right conditions, your inner healer, there's this intelligence that's already in you that knows what you need, that knows how to heal, that knows what was missing. And you give it, you give 
permission and you create the right conditions for that inner healer to start to do its thing, to unwind the body, to unwind the tension, to, you know, bring love and light into the parts that hurt, whatever it might be, there's a, there's a, there's an intelligence that knows how to start to resolve these unprocessed uh, pains and traumas. And, and the right, one of the main things for creating the right space or container or conditions is this patient, loving presence for whatever it is, no matter how horrible it feels. And that can take you a, a long way. And, you know, even if you did this for five minutes every day, you know, bit by bit, you'd start releasing the pain and whatever's stuck in there and, and becoming more and more embodied and then therefore being able to navigate the world from, a, from an intuitive, from a spirit guide. Because spirit also communicates through your body that, you know, the gut feeling or the heart knowing. Or <clears throat> so it's... I can't stress enough how important it is to, to be in the body and then process the stuff that's in the way or that's uncomfortable. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening and following along with that. Awesome. Thanks, thank you. Sash. You know, it, it reminds me of that the Dalai Lama talks about, you know, when we're going through difficulties in our life to know that we're going to be reliving it over and over again because it's such a, a marker of our life. Like all of us that are living this COVID-19 time are going to be going back over this time over and over and over. And the Dalai Lama says that when you're in these trying times, remember that you're going to be going over it over and over again. So make it as joyful and as wonderful and as present as you possibly can be so that, you know, when you're reliving it, you're really reliving it in joy. And Patricia, I'd love to roll over to you because you always have such amazing words, you know, to, to sit and talk to Patricia is like, a grounding hug with everything and you always have the right words you know what Sasha is talking about is you know we're, we're accumulating trauma and so many of us at this time are accumulating you know fear and trauma what kind of things um, or words could you give us that 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 would be helpful and tell us a little bit about yourself too Patricia thank you Wow, it's so nice to be here with all of you guys and sharing this space together. I was a little nervous about going off on after meditation because how do you continue on after that? Um, but it's really beautiful, everything that everyone's saying, tying it together. So I'm gonna do my best to speak from the heart and speak through what comes through. Um, my background is, my name is Patricia. I'm one um, part of Sunroots Farm. I have my family out here in the back, uh, Sunroots crew, kind of giving some love and support. So they're here. Um, <laughs> um, and my partner, Forrest, um, Horace and Jenny. So we are Sunroots Farm. And I really wanted to talk today about this theme of staying grounded and staying through, stay, staying sustainable in this time. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty. We're all walking into this unknown realm and everyone's been kind of feeling it for a long time. I think that there's going to be this major shift and here we are in this present day and moment. Um, a lot of us finding ourselves in isolation and not having the all the tools to do what we want to do in our lives. So for many of us, we're farmers, which is what I am. And I have been doing this for years, uh, working free for many years before I ever got to where I am now. Um, but lots of people in the cities um, who don't have a plot of land to be growing food on and don't have the community sense that um, some of us may have. So what I want to bring to this is keeping our sovereignty, our, our sovereignty and independence, especially in food. Um, like I said, not all of us have access to land, but there is a way to take back your power and take 
control of your food sources and your medicine sources. And now is a time more than ever where we have to start shifting in that direction again and coming back to our roots of our ancestors because many of them would just listen to the plants and knew how to do the work without having education, without having any money, without having anything to their name. So know that within each of us, there is a way always that we can, um, we can take back our own power and come back to nature to supply us with everything that we need. And this is a big part of the Dem Pure um, system and collective. It's a grassroots system, which I really believe in. And we are coming back to the earth to teach us what we need and knowing that she's always got our backs. Um, so really what each individual can do at this point is find um, their own type of education, do their own research, uh, especially in our local communities, what kind of grassroots systems are already in place for creating things such as community gardens or creating um, political, whatever, whatever you're into that's going to inspire you to become more um, sovereign and independent as an individual and as a, as a family, as a unit. Um, as much as we're in community right now, uh, we're also we're also just our own selves. So I think it's really important for us to start seeking out community. And even in these times when everything's supposed to be socially distanced and they're telling us, you know, not to leave our houses, don't have gatherings larger than a certain amount. Some people are wondering, how am I supposed to have community in this time? Um, you know, we can still connect online. Um, we can still connect writing each other and calling each other and just getting back to old school, like knocking on your neighbor's door and, and getting to know them better. <laughs> so at this time it's spring and what we've been doing here is, um, and what we have been doing for years is knowing where our local seed banks are and public library seeds are um, because there is access to free seeds if you don't have free seeds at home for anyone who's watching, please connect with your Demcure farmers. A lot of us are willing to um, mail out seeds to you guys. That's vegetables and medicine. Some people are, are doing cannabis um, as well. So please reach out to us, you know, we're a source here. Um, and after, just like Alexandra was saying, you know, not every method works for everybody. Um, and Terry saying, get grounded and be within yourself. Start planting these seeds. Um, inoculate them, you can put your spit on them <laughs> if you want to actually connect the DNA to the seed and the plant that's going into the ground that you later on um, water and watch through the cycles. And one thing that we like to practice in our garden is saving a little plot or saving a few of the plants to go to seed so that we are now saving our own seed. And we have these open pollination and generations of seeds that are knowing the land, their roots and their whole DNA, their, their anatomy is understanding the land that they are have already come from. So with seeding, people are really technical sometimes um, where they want it to be an exact match, especially in cannabis where people are hand breeding, which is fine. Um, but for those beginners at home too, just saving tomato seeds and saving lettuce seeds and onion seeds and saving some garlic so you can plant it in the fall, things like that are, are really important. And it's a beautiful way to have something from your land that's, that's generational. Um, seeds that you can be starting right now are greens, vegetables, um, and your medicine, whatever medicine you're doing, and your perennials that you want to start. Um, another um, food source that I really believe in is your native, wild, local food and medicine. I am some examples of this are miner's lettuce. This stuff is growing everywhere. Um, it's, there's different varieties depending on where you live. There's chickweed, there's sheep cereal, there's acorns, there's yellow dock, yellow docks growing everywhere. There's purslane, there's stinging nettle. Here in California, you have bay laurel nuts, dandelions. These are all 
just what some may consider weeds and probably a lot of us already know this, but we can use this as food. So knowing what's happening in our local environments and just keeping in mind, you know, if I'm not growing food, where can I source food from? A lot of our neighbors down in the city, even in California, um, in the Bay Area have lemons and oranges and down in Santa Rosa, you have kiwis growing almost wild. People planted them and then there, there's, there's this abundance of food. So we're really planting for our futures and we're planting for everybody, um, bringing back that community. Like, yes, we feed ourselves, but we also have this abundance to feed others. So, and like Alexander was saying, you don't wanna go crazy right now and be in, in this uh, state that I need to plant all the seeds I have, you know, because who knows what's gonna happen. Save some of those seeds, um, but plant extra so that you can help feed your community too. It's, I think really right now, the most important thing that we can do in this pandemic is come together in a way that we never have, um, solidify our, our communities, because we develop resilience when we do that. And we are so powerful together. We're powerful as individuals, especially when we take the time to heal ourselves and to become you know, our highest self and form in this current world that we're living. But when we magnify and come together with people of like goals who have the same ideas of organization, it just makes it all the more powerful. So let's do that. Let's continue reaching out to our community. Um, if that has to be online, so let it be. Um, <clears throat> another thing that we're doing right now is making soil. I think uh, making soil is one of the most uh, amazing things you can do because again, you're finding independence and you're relying on solely yourself. Um, and some for those unsure of how to make soil on their, on their own, I mean, everything that you eat uh, other than certain ingredients like some animal products and whatnot you are putting in the compost pile. So that's part of your soil that you're creating. And then maybe you go down the road and there's a bunch of leaf mold and somebody wants it raked up and elderly wants their yard raked for a fire prevention or something. Go ahead and rake up their leaves and take that and put it on your compost pile. Uh, make sure nothing's sprayed uh, and hopefully it's all organic. Um, grasses, wood cutting, shavings, nut holes, um, really listening to your intuition about what you can add into your soils that works because there's many different ingredients and there's all different things that are going to come from your area that are specific to your area and that are in tune with your area that are going to make your soil thrive. When you have thriving soil, you have thriving plants, you consume all of this and then you as an individual are thriving and there's this deep connection from the earth through the plant through you through the cosmos everything's coming together to nurture you and i think this is a high belief that the world and the place that we've been living in has been telling us not to focus on we've really lost this connection of our existence and our connection to mother earth, to the cosmos, to our ancestors, to all that is around us. Everything is living and breathing. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It is here. We're breathing in the same um, breath that the Dalai Lama breathed in, for example. So come back to that knowing that here we are, powerful beings, we're skeletons and bones and stardust, and uh, that may sound whatever, but I, I really do believe that on a molecular level, we have the ability to heal ourselves in some ways. And I believe in going in any type of medicinal route you need to go um, that feels right to you, of course. But just coming back to ourselves, coming back to our communities and getting back to these grassroots systems where we are all working together again and, and really showing proving to ourselves that we can we can do this together. I and love I that. that, that's so beautiful and it's so true. And you guys really do embody everything that you're saying. And we've had the privilege to be in your home and at your space and you know, meet your family and your crew 
lots of love to Forrest and, and everyone there. Um, and Patricia and Forrest, I just want to thank you all so much for upholding, you know, the, the ultimate goal of real regenerative living. Not only are you all regenerative in your gardens, but you're regenerative in your community. People out there, Patricia and Forrest are literally in every community meeting. They're 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 connecting with people all over California as well as people in Covalo where they're at. So I just want to commend you all for being just such upstanding human beings and and, a, and an incredible um, marker for all. I would of like us. to commend you for your pantry. <laughs> that too. <laughs> because you. <laughs> Really medicine, all the medicine. <laughs> it's all glass jars and it's it's just, uh, it's really beautiful. And if anybody wants to see Patricia and Forrest Pantry, go on to Instagram, they've got pictures of it. It's astounding. It's <laughs> absolutely amazing. And we wanted to move over to Alexis, what you were mentioning, Patricia, is this incredible power that we have with a connection to, to Mother Earth, you know, wild crafting. And, and, and you mentioned so many different herbs that we have that can sustain us and that can give us nutrient rich, you know, dense foods that, that are right here, you know, maybe even in our lawns. So, um, and I love that our group is so diverse. And Alexis, you're out from Ontario. Can you tell us a little about yourself? and what your thoughts are. Sure, yeah, can you guys hear me? <clears throat> cool, right on, well, thank you. Yeah, um, I really concur and uh, feel grateful to be on this this panel and to listen to what everyone's saying. It's It really pulls things in in a beautiful way. And, um, you know, my, my name's Alexis Burnett. Uh, I live here on Rebel Roots Herb Farm with my wife, Bobby, and our two kids, River and, and Violet. And uh, we're in, in Great Lakes country, so we're kind of sandwiched in between Georgian Bay and, um, and Lake Huron, and we live on uh, traditional Saugeen, uh, Anishinaabek First Nation territory is where we are here. So I always like to start with um, acknowledging the, the land and uh, the original caretakers that, uh, that have looked after this land for, for thousands of years and, and who continue to look after the land here. Um, and, uh, and work in such a, a beautiful way. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting times we, we live in. I, I love to hear um, and be with all these folks tonight and, and talking about ways that we can ground ourselves. And, um, you know, something that <clears throat> I did this morning with my kids, cause they're, they're around a lot more um, now, like all of you, a lot of you probably have kids around or some of you anyways. Uh, and um, we went out this morning and, and sang a little song to the sun as the sun came up. Um, we walked out, it was a beautiful frosty morning here. Uh, the ice just left our pond the other day and, and we went out and, uh, and all three of us, my two kids and I sang a little song towards the sun, which was just a beautiful way to greet today. And we came up over the hill and there were some deer and uh, Canada geese flew over and the killdeers were singing and the red winged blackbirds. And it was just, it was really, really a beautiful moment. And um, you know, thinking about what Patricia was saying is uh, at this time of year in the springtime, um, there's so many plants that are coming back. And uh, here where we live in um, Eastern Woodlands territory, there's well over 400 um, different edible plants. If you take into account the trees and the shrubs, um, the herbaceous plants um, that we can eat and that traditional peoples did eat. Um, and I always say that, you know, think about what your diet would be, what your life and your, your diet would be like if you actually ate 400 different plants throughout the year. Um, I don't have enough time to talk about 400, <laughs> nor could I. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a handful tonight. And for some people on the panel, it'll, it's probably be old hat, but I wanted to, um, to talk about some really common ones because there's hopefully people out on um, in the internet land here that uh, that are maybe new to foraging and wild crafting and uh, it's such a beautiful way that empowers us to know where our food comes from and to be able to go out on the land and harvest food so you know no matter where we're from um, you know maybe most of us aren't traditional peoples from Turtle Island or um, from North America, but wherever we trace our lineages to, our ancestors lived off the land and they knew the plants and they knew them through the seasons. Um, and 
I also just want to start that, you know, for, for us here on our little farm, you know, we, we are, are very privileged in a lot of ways because we're, you know, we have a little bit of land and we can move around and we're out in the forest. And, you know, I just want to recognize that there's a lot of people out there uh, that don't have those, you know, those things. They're not living on in farms. They're living maybe in bigger cities or urban areas and, and it's tricky. And I hope um, some of those folks can take some of the things that you learned here tonight and, and incorporate those into your life. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to share my screen because I did, um, I do a lot of these kind of presentations. So I basically just kind of high graded a few, um, a few slides out. And if someone could just let me know if you can, can you guys see my screen there? Yeah, okay, I see a couple thumbs up, so that's good. Um, so let's see, from the beginning. I'm just gonna um, try through a few things. Uh, so as I said, we we run Rebel Roots Herb Farm. I also run a wilderness school called Earth Tracks. And, um, and in the last few, couple of years, we started a, Sort of cannabis education company because hey, you know we can uh, we can talk about cannabis now, um, or at least a lot of you probably always did. But uh, for me, working with kids, um, I wasn't always uh, able to to chat as freely as I wanted to over the last twenty some years. Um, but uh, I just want to start by uh, talking about the three rights of edible plants. I'll probably go through some of this a little quick, and I may skip over some of the medicinal stuff. Um, but we can come back to it any time. But you always want to start with the right season. So you got to make sure that you're harvesting plants during the right season. So an example might be like fiddleheads in the springtime are, are quite edible, especially when you cook them. Um, I recommend cooking them, but they're, the ferns aren't so edible afterwards when they, they open up. Um, milkweed pods would be another thing. Milkweed is an, a great edible plant, um, not one that we need to fear as much as people used to, to tell us we did. Uh, but knowing the right season, the next part is um, the right part of the plant. So like making sure like, you know, you're harvesting the roots, if it's the roots that you're after, or the, if that's where the medicine or the food value is, if it's the leaves, and if it's the flowers. So, you know, the right season, the right part. Um, <clears throat> and then the right preparation. This is a, a big one because there's a lot of books out there. If you're learning from books and not from say a grandparent or an elder, um, you, they don't always tell you about the preparation. And um, I sometimes say, you know, our ancestors, well, I always say our ancestors were, were very smart people. And I think in this day and age, we, we kind of move quickly with technology and we forget that, um, you know, we forget that like our ancestors lived on the land for thousands of years and to get to know the land and the plants um there's just so much incredible knowledge there so a lot are you know the preparations can sometimes be complex but often they're very simple just take the leaf and eat it you know um but definitely look into those things and then i'll just kind of preface to you know always have a hundred percent id before you eat anything and that was just something that my teachers taught me when i was younger and um and I just always stuck with it. One of my first herbal and, and plant teachers said, I was never poisoned by a plant I didn't eat. Um, so, you know, just don't put anything in your mouth unless you're, uh, unless you're 100% um, sure what it is. And that might be, it might be meaning, you know, going out on hikes with people that are educated and, um, or just have experience is probably a better word than, than edu educated. Um, but if you don't have those, um, look for some good field guides. Um, and uh, I'm not going to get into kind of what constitutes a good field guide, but I always do recommend this one, the Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. It's, it's a great identification book. Um, it's not going to tell you how to use plants for food and medicine, but it's definitely uh, a great book. This is the old cover. Um, so if you see a book like that, you can usually get them at sometimes used bookstores and, and online. Um, and then I just want to say, you know, no, this is something that's important to me. I, you know, I'm not First Nations, but I, I work with a lot of First Nations people here in Ontario. I have some great friends that are First Nations people. Um, and I think it's really important, and I always try to teach this to people, um, is, you know, know whose traditional territory you're on. Uh, because, you know, as I think it was Alexandra that said, you know, the, the land still has these, like, the stories are still very much in the land. Um, and, you know, if you're living in an area where maybe you don't know the First Nations people that are there, look, look into it. And, you know, I won't say much more than that, but to me, it's really important to know whose land you're, you're on and, 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 um, and being respectful, I guess I'd say. So the first one I'll just start with quickly and, and go through, because a lot of people I'm sure know it, but um, 
is uh, the dandelion, the the uh, piss on piss on the or piss on the the pee the bed plant, <laughs> um, the da uh, Dante Leon. Uh, that's sort of the French version uh, or the French names, the teeth of the lion, referring to the leaves. Um, the dandelion is just such an amazing plant for people to, that should get to know. I always say like. You know, we spend in North America probably hundreds of millions of dollars on toxic chemicals trying to kill this weed. And it's just such an important um, plant for us. It, it's an old world plant or it's a plant that came um, with some of our ancestors to North America and they brought it for a reason because it's, it's an, a great edible. Um, it's also a great um, medicinal herb too. Uh, but basically the whole plant is edible. You can use the, the young leaves in a salad. The older leaves tend to get a little bit bitter. Um, I like to use them a bit more. It's like a pot herb at that point. Um, I dry dandelion greens all the time and I crush them up um, or I dry them and then I try to keep all my plants whole until right before I use them. And you know we load mason jars full of dandelion greens and then I just crush them up and put them in pasta sauce and um, in eggs and all kinds of things all year long. Uh, they're full of vitamins, uh, you know, vitamin A, B, C, D, potassium, really high in iron. Um, there's more vitamin A than uh, is it found in carrots. Um, so those are some ways that we use the leaves. The, the flowers are, are a great one. Um, people make wine with them. We make cookies with them. You can make fritters with them. Um, I often say, you know, you deep fry anything and it, it tastes good, <laughs> but dandelion flowers actually taste great on their own. You can pop the whole things in uh, your mouth. It's fun to make, you know, flower, um, you know, dandelion flower uh, cookies with the kids, those kind of things. Um, the roots are great in dandelion. Sometimes, you know, a lot of people talk about roasting them to make a good coffee substitute. Um, I also like to just saute them. Uh, we make decoctions with them, which is just another form of of a tea when you're actually boiling uh, the root a little more. Um, I won't get into much of the medicine, but I, I sometimes I kind of tend to think more of the, the root being a bit more of a kidney med or uh, liver tonic medicine, increasing bile flow, and then uh, more of the um, leaves for the, the uh, kidneys um, and so on. There's, there's some studies out there with dandelions and uh, cancer right now too. Um, but as I said, I'll just kind of move through some of these a little bit quicker. Um, these are the burdocks. Most people are probably familiar with these. If you're not, um, you know, you probably had burrs in your wool clothing before. Um, we sometimes call them survival Velcro. They were the inspiration for Velcro, those little birds. It's a beautiful survival strategy of the plant. I often like to think, you know, like what is the survival strategy of this plant? And, and it's basically to hook on to people and animals and move throughout the landscape and then, and then get dropped and, and have the seeds dispersed. Um, I, my favorite part of burdock for medicine would be, be definitely the root. Um, you can get some amazing roots. Like I've had baseball bat size roots, you know, two, three feet long and like sometimes quite, quite thick. Like you could use it as a little bit of a, um, a weapon <laughs> or just for fun, maybe for baseball. Um, but you eat them. Uh, I like to, I've been getting into fermenting them a little bit lately, uh, putting them into kimchi recipes. Uh, things like that, which is great. We can store, like I store the roots often just like you would carrots when you layer them with uh, damp sand. So I'll sometimes harvest like a bunch. We usually harvest all our roots in the fall time. I was taught for a lot of roots, every plant is different, but harvesting them after the first frost, first or second frost, when it triggers the plant to send its energy back down into the roots. So burdock is a biennial plant. So meaning it has a two year life cycle. So. Um, I generally get the roots in the, the fall of the first year. Sometimes I'll, I'll dig them in the spring as well. I find if you get them early in the spring, they're generally pretty good. But once they start to grow up, um, a lot of that energy, the starches and the roots start to go move up to the plant um, for that aerial growth. And then the roots get stringy. I do tell people when you're digging the roots, like take your time and you know honor the plant by trying to get that whole root out of the ground. Um, burdock isn't so much like dandelion, where if you leave a little piece of dandelion in the ground, it'll come back. Um, but, uh, and, and the, one of the other reasons I, I try to get the whole root is because the bottom third is really actually the tastiest part of the burdock fruit. Uh, so um, you want to get it down there. Sometimes I'll, I'll stir fry them. I often take the rind off. Um, so that's just sort of the layer um, on the outside of the skin of the root, like kind of the, if you think of it like a potato, um, and then I'll eat, um, I'll saute those, I'll, I'll 
stir fry them, do all kinds of things. Uh, we made some really cool sort of uh, burdock burritos and stuff like that, mixing them in with, you know, if you're vegan or vegetarian, do your vegetarian things. If you like venison, like I like venison and burdock burritos. I think they're, they're great. Um, the white pithy part of the leaves and the stem can be eaten, added to salads. Um, that's sort of shaven off the outside. Um, we use the leaves actually, I don't think it's on this slide, but to wrap uh, fish in and or even stuffed peppers. And then we throw them right on the fire and you can cook them right on the fire. They basically act as uh, sort of like a frying pan or a pot, um, which works great. If you get, you know, fresh salmon, we'll often catch out of Georgian Bay and then, you know, put a bunch of wild mint and, um, you know, sweet gale is really great with, uh, with the salmon and then wrap them, cook them right on the fire. Um, you know, Danny, or uh, sorry, burdock is a great one for, for the liver again. Um, it's a bitter plant. So, you know, a lot of people will equate bitters with digestive system and stimulating the bitter receptors um, down through, um, through, I guess, as Terry would say, the hollow donut. I think, Terry, you, you talk about the <laughs> moving down through the digestive system. Um, externally, I've used them as washes for uh, hives, eczema, skin eruptions, different things like that. Um, let's see. Uh, and then I'll just say at the end, try, try, uh, well, don't try not to, but don't confuse them with, um, with rhubarb. And again, you know, for some of you that are used to growing these plants or seeing these plants, you know, you're probably pretty, uh, well versed in how to identify them well. But when you're new, we sometimes say it's kind of the wall of green out there. A lot of people just look in the forest and it's like, whoa, everything's green. Uh, but the more we kind of zero in on learning our plants, um, you start to uh, you start to differentiate them. So the burdock is definitely quite different from rhubarb, but to the untrained eye, they can be um, they can be similar. So um, I just want to kind of mention that. And along those lines, if you're new to foraging and wildcrafting, you know, pick like one plant a week or a, maybe even a month. Like if you got to know one plant a month, what is there, 12 months in a year? Um, or if you did one plant a week, that would be 52 plants in a year. Um, you know, and you could really start to learn these things quite quick. For myself, it's been, I don't know, 25 years uh, that I've been focused on foraging, uh, but really it's been a lot longer, you know, growing up with my parents and, um, and growing gardens and things like that. Um, this is a plant that's not, uh, it's a bit more to the East Coast, but I did, I did a little more research and, and it is apparently moving West and moving around. This is the garlic mustard plant. Um, it's an amazing, um, well, it's what a lot of people call invasive. Um, I don't always buy into the, the train of thought of, um, you know, all invasive species are bad. Uh, it is sad to see what it can do to some eastern woodland forests here. But um, with that said, there's, there is a study by, that you can kind of read what I wrote about the University of Boston study, but it's, it's actually not as detrimental to the native plants as, as people used to think. Um, that may ruffle some feathers in the conservation industry, but you know, we all need our feathers rump ruffled every now and again. Um, but the leaves are, are great. Uh, you know, they're great seasoning. I eat them raw in salads. You can cook them. Uh, they're great in soups. Um, again, you, you know, you can use it as a pot herb. We dry these for winter use, like just like Patricia said, like we, I'll dry you know, purslane and um, nettles and dandelion greens and um, all kinds of those le leafy greens, creeping Charlie, uh, amaranth, lamb's quarters, and then I just have jars of them for the winter, and we throw them in um, to our food. I love making pesto with this plant. I find that the pesto made from the stalks is actually a little bit better quality than um, it, than using the leaves. I still use some of the leaves, but I like to use those stalks. You can eat the stalks like asparagus. Um, just know it's not going to taste like asparagus. It's garlic mustard. It's garlicky. It's mustardy. Um, but you you know you can use them in a similar way to asparagus. The first year roots are um, are a nice horseradish substitute too. Uh, the second year roots again kind of get stringy. Um, it is a biennial garlic mustard, so it, um, you know, the second year it's all about reproduction. The first year it's about putting on mass, putting on uh, like roots specifically. Second year it's about aerial growth, sending seeds out. Um, they say there's more vitamin A than spinach, there's more vitamin C than orange juice. Um, you know, there's some different uh, parts of how this plant can be used uh, from a herbal perspective. 
Um, I have used it with pretty good luck on, um, or pretty good results for wounds. Um, not so much my personally for ulcers, but definitely wounds and cuts and using it as a poultice. Um, and then just to kind of mention too, like since, since a lot of us do work with cannabis and, and just growing things in general, I found this has been a great plant for fermented teas. Um, that I've used, you know, like comfrey is a great one, stinging nettle, those kind of things. But I, I definitely use uh, a lot of the garlic mustard um, in fermented teas um, as well. It's, uh, it's got a lot of nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium. There's also a fair amount of potassium, copper, iron, manganese, uh, selenium, those kind of things in there. So just to kind of throw that in, it's good for our bodies, it's good for our plants. Um, and they actually uh, put a lot of those, um, or they draw up those nutrients, and then when the plants die back, they're they're putting them into the soil um, as well. So anyway, some people would probably want to shoot me for talking uh, good things about garlic mustard, but anyways, however, um, the and then we'll you know talking about stinging nettle. Many many folks are familiar with the stinging nettle plant. Um, this is one that I really love to uh, to use a lot. Um, we also have a wood, wood nettle here. It's actually a different genus um, than the sting nettle, but it can be used interchangeably. So if you live on the East Coast, uh, there's actually a beautiful plant called wood nettle. Um, oh, I forget the Latin on it, Leptora something or other, but uh, it's, it's a really cool one. It's actually not opposite branching, it's alternate branching, but um, the nettle, like, you know, I, I sometimes think of nettle just like spinach. You know, I put it in anything that you would put spinach in. Um, I'll use it as a pot herb. Uh, I don't eat a lot of nettle um, raw. You know, you can, and like I have, but you may get, you know, like when, when I was 20, 20 some years ago, I would, you know, you could roll up the nettle and you could eat it, um, you know, and, <laughs> and all those kind of things. As I got older, I didn't really um, care to do those things as much. Uh, some people use them for stimulation. Uh, as well. I know Terry's son, um, Yarrow's got some cool videos on, um, you know, um, stimulating circulation and people using it on their knuckles for uh, rheumatoid arthritis and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, basically the leaves and the young tops we use, we have some nettles that are just starting to poke out of the ground. So they're one of my favorite spring greens. You know, our bodies really crave these like nutritious plants. Um, in the springtime. So, you know, the nettle is just a great one to get to know. Put it in your omelets and your frittatas, put it in your spaghetti sauces, your, um, I don't know, whatever you're eating, stir frying. Um, it's just a great one to put in. You can make amazing soup stocks with nettle as well. Um, you know, we'll just boil up or make a nice tea and then, you know, put all your, your um, other root vegetables and things like that in. It's just a great strengthening, um, supporting kind of the entire body, a nice nutritive tonic, um, really high in iron, vitamin C. Um, yeah, so a lot of people know about nettle. Again, we use it a lot in our fermented teas. Um, from sort of a wilderness perspective, it makes amazing cordage. It's just like a super strong Cordage. You can actually make like bowstrings with nettle, a lot of fishing line, things like that. Um, you can make with it. It's a, it's a great plant that's you know kind of common all over the world, um, or at least a lot of the, the world. I'm not a world, worldly traveler, but I know it's definitely over in Europe, anyways. Um, and then there's the plantain. Uh, I just got one or two more, and then we'll, I'll pass it on. But um, yeah, plantain's just an amazing first aid herb. It's one that I love to uh, to use a lot in the spring. Uh, the young leaves are edible raw or um, in a salad or cooked as a pot herb. Um, I blanch them a lot and kind of freeze them, especially when they get older. Uh, but again, you know, adding it to soups, stews, you know, a lot of these are like, these are really common plants that can be just, you know, there's that saying, our food is our medicine. And you know, I encourage people to just get out and, and start working with, with some of these, um, these common plants and using them. You can put them into casseroles. We've made spring rolls with, um, with uh, plantain leaves, lasagna. We put them, you know, they go really good with rice. Uh, they do get a little bit fibery for sure. You can see this little, uh, when you pull the leaves, they have this kind of latexy uh, leaf vein in there. Sometimes I make a little joke, like it's just a little tiny accordion. The kids always like that. Um, and then the seeds are great, you know, raw or cooked. Um, 
you can uh, ground them into a sort of like a flower type, type substance. I'll usually mix it with either other wild flowers. So like F-L-O-U-R um, flower. Uh, they mix really well with like, um, well, like let's say uh, oaks, like make an acorn meal. They mix well with uh, cattail pollen, with pine pollen. Um, a lot of the grasses, you know, you can grind a lot of grass seed, just like wheat and things like that. But there's a lot of native grasses that we could use um, as well. There's about, th they say 30% mucilage in, um, in uh, the seeds as well. So it's sort of like psyllium seed. Uh, people use it for digestion. It's a bit of a mild laxative. Um, plantain chips, anyone? Plantain chips are really good. We often make uh, nettle and uh, plantain chips by just dehydrating them. If you don't have a dehydrator, you can do it in your oven. There's also all kinds of really cool solar dehydrators. Those are things you could do right in the city, even on your balcony if you're facing south. Um, make one of those cool little solar dehydrators. Um, let's see. Uh, I do want to mention just for, for bee stings and insect bites and things like that, I always teach kids about um, plantain because it's an easy plant to identify. It's, um, and it just is great for like red ant bites or like bee stings. I'm someone that swells up quite a bit if I get stung by a bee and I find if I can get chew up plantain and just make a quick spit poultice and get it on there, um, it'll, uh, I usually won't swell up. Um, so I love just teaching it to, to kids. It's empowering for kids to know what to do when they've got stung by something. Uh, and then you'll see them just, it's a chain reaction. They just start show, telling other kids um, and, you know, they just love to, to share that knowledge. And, and I just really love that. Um, some folks call it, uh, uh, some of the First Nations people I work with uh, would call it white man's foot, because they said anywhere that the white people went in North America, this plant was sure to follow, because it really likes compact soils. Unfortunately, some of our ancestors tended to um, compact soils <laughs> and, uh, you know, make wide roads and big paths and things like that. Um, and uh, the plantain is, uh, is often found on people's lawns in those areas of compaction a lot more. It actually helps with the fibery roots. There's a bit of a tap root and then the fibery roots and it actually helps to break up that compacted soil. So I often tell people to think about like the plants, we often have this human centric view of the world um, and we think plants are just here to help us and to heal us and feed us, but they're actually working on so many levels, whether it's insects and animals and so on and so on. Um, but there is a native species of plant, plantain too, um, Plantago uh, rugali. Um, and I'm not sure how far out west that one goes, but it definitely is around us. It has a bit more of a red stem on it. And so the First Nations people definitely worked with this plant before the other one came. And then uh, lastly, I'll just finish up on lamb's quarters because I think lamb's quarters is a great one uh, to get to know. It's, it's a purifying plant. It helps to restore nutrients to the soil. It definitely tends to spread quickly, especially in low nutrient um, or contaminated soils. It also spreads quickly in, in, uh, in well, um, lots of nutrient dense soils in our gardens. But um, this is one, you know, when I first met my wife and she was selling all these vegetables at farmer's markets, I was just sort of going through the garden and weeding plants and eating them. And I always had these jokes like, you know, these weeds have more are more nutrient dense than, um, than the stuff you're growing. <laughs> and that's true for a lot of wild foods is that there, there's just so much nutrient value in there. So thinking about the, the lamb's quarters, the leaves, the young shoots, the seeds, um, the flowers, they're, they're all edible. You can eat them, you know, raw, juiced, cooked. Be careful with juicing, you know, um, not that I'm against juicing, juicing's great, but sometimes if you're new to juicing, people will just put a ton of plant material in and they'll just juice it and then they pound it back. Um, and then all of a sudden you're getting like a huge overload of, of nutrition and your body can't take that and it'll sometimes come back up. Um, some of the uh, lamb's quarters do have a bit of oxalic acid in them. It, it tends to be dispelled, at least from what I've learned when you cook. Um, and, and they also tend to be, a, it tends to be a little bit higher in the older leaves. Um, there's a lot of mineral salts in there that they're drawing up from the soil. I, um, I was taught that that's what that white sheen on the leaves are. Um, it's kind of that earthy mineral sort of rich taste as well. Um, I love, I love eating this, this plant. I, I dry and freeze a whole bunch of it. Um, you can sprout the seeds like quinoa. 
um, or they're quinoa like seeds and you can, you can sprout them. You can even mash up the roots and uh, make like kind of a usable soap. I think it's the saponins that are in the root um, and it'll lather up a little bit, which is, is kind of fun um, to play around with. They say that one cup of greens contains 73% uh, vitamin A, 96% vitamin C of like what your daily dose is. Um, and it also contains some B vitamin complex um, like uh, thiamine, riboflavin, niacine um, and those things as well. So anyways, there's that. Uh, and then just in, in kind of closing here, I'll just say, uh, I often tell people to focus on, uh, especially when you're getting, you're starting, I think it's good to focus on uh, the non-native plants or the naturalized plants in your area. Um, and and there, there's a few reasons that I, I think this is important. One is just for conservation. Um, and and two is, that I think it's, it's just respectful. Um, you know, it, uh, a lot of our culture today and society, we, we've taken a lot from the earth. We've taken a lot from the traditional peoples of the land um, and we're not always giving back. And, you know, sometimes with this craze of foraging and it, it's getting kind of like, I don't know what do they call it now, like a hipsters and stuff, uh, you know, getting all into foraging and, and stuff. And it's easy not to be respectful of the plants. So um, I think it's important to start with the non-native ones until you start to get to know the plants. Um, I always tell people, research what your ancestors ate, you know, look at like, where, where are you from? Um, where did you come from? And what did your peoples eat? You know, because a lot of the plants that are the non-native naturalized plants are plants that our ancestors ate, like the red clovers, um, the burdocks, the dandelions. These are plants that they we brought with us when we came to North America. Um, so, you know, research a little bit of that. Uh, always start with small quantities. You know, the, the wild foods are very nutrient dense. Um, so, you know, often we can't take all that nutrition. Like, like if we eat too much, like I often say, get out of the olive garden mentality or someone mentioned like, you know, we don't need to eat a salad like this bake on a plate. Um, you know, when you're talking wild greens, it's a lot less because your body's going to tell you when it's had enough um, because the nutritional value is really a lot higher than a lot of the plants we're used to eating. Um, and then also just to make sure you're not going to have some sort of a personal um, reaction. I, I really think there's an irrational fear around wild plants. People seem to think like, you know, berries are going to pop off and like go into your child's mouths and um, all of a sudden everyone's just going to die when we start eating these wild plants again. Uh, but you do want to be careful and, and start small. Uh, size bees, I guess you could say. Um, and then I'll just mention, you know, start foraging now because like what, what better time to, to start, you know? Um, these are skills that, like as I said, our ancestors always knew and uh, they're great to pass on to kids and you know, I'm, I'm not really a doom and gloom person at all. I do think that, you know, part of this whole thing that's going on is, you know, I think it is a wake up call for us and there's changes that we need to make in our lives. But, um, you know, we, I think it's good to just get out and start, if things do go down, like I, as I said, I, tr I try to, uh, I choose hope over fear most of the time as much as I possibly can. But if things do change and, and you know our lives change in a big way. We don't want to have to start to learn the plants that we can eat when the changes come and happen. You want to start now and get to know these plants, start to eat them, get used to the different tastes. Because in in North America, it's a lot of you know we love our uh, sweets and we love our salt. You know, like potato chips and cookies, man. Like just piling it in, or like I, I know most of you don't do that, and I don't necessarily either. But there's so many tastes in the wild. There's the bitter taste, the sour taste, and like we're not used to. A lot of people aren't used to eating those. So start to get used to them. You know, wild food doesn't all taste like wild leeks and maple syrup. Like um, there are some different tastes, and it may take a little bit of time. Um, and then just Thank practice you. good wildcrafting ethics. And um, and I think I'll leave it there. Sorry if I took too long. Um, here's a little bit if you want to get a hold of us sometime. But uh, yeah, thank you. I tried to go a little bit quick. I hope it wasn't too long. Um, and uh, yeah, I wish everyone the best. Stay healthy out there. Um, keep a good attitude. You know, enjoy your time with uh, with kids if you have them. Um, yeah, let's be good people. Let's look out for each other. Build community. Build soil. Build health. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Thanks, Alexis. I gotta see how I can stop this. Separate. So important to, uh, yeah, understand uh, about the native plants around us. And 
also the invasive species around us. And you were talking a lot about, you know, sovereignty um, with, with food. And I wanted to, we wanted to move right on to Daniel from Bryceland Farm. Daniel, you are a shining, amazing example, you and Taylor and your children and what you all are doing for the community and raising food. I'd uh, love to hear about what's going on in, in, in uh, Mendocino and, and what kind of things are you growing? Daniel? Uh, you might be muted. You're, You're muted. muted, Daniel. You're muted. Um, hey, thanks so much. Uh, we're, we're actually uh, up in Humboldt County uh, in, in the coast range, uh, about uh, 20 minutes or so as the crow flies from, from the Lost Coast here um, in, in Weeok territory. Um, there you go. There you go. That's better. Yeah, we knew that. We knew that recently. Yeah. Um, so so here on the farm, we're, we're getting a lot of stuff rolling. Um, just getting out and getting the first stuff in the ground over the last few weeks, seeding out carrots and beets and radishes and, and greens and and uh, have greenhouses brimming full of starch ready to go in the ground and um, and doing a lot of, of soil preparation. And, you know, I I thought I'd use this opportunity to, to talk to people who are um, interested or starting a garden for the first time or, or haven't done it in a while to to um, think about and, and, and plan and, and walk through that because, um, you know, it, it it can be daunting and and when you haven't had that experience in a while there's there's a, a lot of different ways you can take it so i i know that um you know it, it's a very um difficult and can sometimes fear feel powerless right now when when we realize how much we're dependent on a, a supply chain and a food system that isn't really um being responsible and how it produces food and how it brings it to us. And um, whether uh, people are starting gardens to actually supply their own food or just to, to empower themselves and make themselves realize that they don't have to be dependent on these systems. So if you're working on getting out in the garden for the first time in a while or, or opening up a new space, I think one of the, one of the first steps to take is, is really take a look at the space you have and think about the things that you want to eat. Um, you know, it's a it's a, a very common mistake just to go buy a bunch of plants or a bunch of seeds and throw it all in there and 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 overcrowd everything and not really um, get the most value out of what you're planting. So um, the the first thing I'd like to I like to think of is 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 look at maybe even draw out the space you have and think about about spacing you'll, you'll see on a seed packet or if you read a, a plant you're planting online it'll say you know plant them in rows two feet six inches or or whatever and and you can kind of ignore but use it as a guideline and, and do it a little bit closer and figure something like broccoli wants to be a foot to a foot and a half away from another broccoli plant plant and um so I, I like to think about those spacing and, and think about the complexity of spacing, whereas, you know, broccoli might want to be a foot and a half away from another broccoli plant, but it's not going to fill in that space for a while. So so radishes could easily fill in that space in, until the broccoli comes in or, or lettuce or, or something else that, that grows fast. Um, and then if you're working with limited space in the garden, I, I really think it it, it's valuable to think about getting the most bang for your buck nutritionally and, and value wise. You Potatoes are wonderful to grow, but you can go to the store, you can buy potatoes and they'll last you months and months. If you're at home for a month without being able to go to the store, what do you want to be able to walk out in your yard and eat? Do you, do you want your, your fresh salads? Um, do, you, do you want brassicas, things like broccoli? Um, cabbage, carrots, beets, what do you want to be eating and, and what do you want to have available freshest? What, what's not available to you in quality and freshness in your local area? Um, 
And with that in mind, I, I, I've talked about broccoli a few times here, but I, I would absolutely not recommend just planting a traditional broccoli to anybody with a small garden starting out for the first time. I'd, I'd say um, they take a lot of space and you get one meal out of them. Um, plant a sprouting broccoli and, and, and think about planting things that give continuously. Um, where brassicas like, like kale or, or collards or, or sprouting broccoli where you can go out into the garden, you can harvest yourself a meal and, and it'll regrow and, and provide um, many, many meals out of that same space. Um, also, um, wh when you get started, it, um, I know a, a lot of people I've talked to imagine a garden as this thing, you, you start seeds, you plant a garden, the garden grows, you're done. But we start seeds every week because we want to eat food every week. And, and I, I would say just keep starting seeds, keep planting. If you want to have a, a salad ev every night, plant plant lettuce every week and every week transplant some out. Um, if you want to, um, you know, that if you, you want to eat carrots all season long, plant a little row of carrots continuously. And, and, and so you'll always have some that are, that are at the ripeness you want them. It, uh, if you want to have something quick and, and, and feel empowered like your garden's grown you something plant some radishes because man you can almost see those suckers grow um so uh i i guess uh i i really am excited about this time about people feeling inspired with the time and space to to delve into their their homes and the spaces around their homes and thinking about providing for themselves for their families for their neighbors and um and the empowerment that will come from that. Um, and pretty brief, I don't know uh, what questions anybody would have I, or the depth to dive into gardening because there's layers and layers and layers of it. Um, work on your soil, speaking of layers, um, collect compost, make your soil good, make a good plan, plant seeds and, and um, keep going at it. Oh, I think I was going to say a moment too about, you know, there, there's a lot of plants that will take up a lot of area in a, in a small garden um, and to get creative with those kind of things with, with space and with area, you might not have room in your garden if it's small to plant a zucchini plant, but you might have a compost pile and the zucchini will be perfectly happy growing out of the top of your compost pile. Um, and on the other side of your compost pile, plant some winter squash too, because that can just sprawl out of over an unused area or some walkways that you're not using and um and come winter time you'll have some some winter squash for for your soups and and your winter meals yeah you guys make amazing um compost i love how you integrate the polyculture style growing with the, the medicine and the food and you really are give back to your community by you know providing food so really you are embodying you know what what uh what really needs to happen on the earth right now and i love it how you um you know incorporate the children into it um and it's really beautiful so we love your family and it's really fun to watch your instagram and everything that you guys are doing yeah and also daniel i wanted to ask you you were mentioning a lot about spacing and and uh you know talking about vegetables and spacing what about nutrient value if people only have a really small amount of space which a lot of people are backyard gardeners and we talk a lot about nutrient dense foods we've been working a lot with nutrient dense foods what would you suggest to people that might be easy and still hold you know sort of like a supplement full mineral rich uh you know as well as the food well um i'd say the two things that i would recommend highly are um, leafy greens like like kale and uh, uh, root veggies like beets. Um, you know, both of those will have a lot of iron, a lot of uh, uh, micronutrients and minerals in them that, that are quickly available. Beets um, have the additional benefit of, of being really good tops and roots and, and a, a lot of available sugar. Um, in general, one of the better things people can do, uh, it's, it's a little more um, 
Um, intensive the is is either test your soil or understand where your soil's at because if your soil is is healthy and has all of the minerals that it needs, most of what you grow in it is going to provide you with really nutrient dense food. And um, and if your soil is deficient, you see the plants that you're growing are deficient in nutrients. They're not going to have the nutrients in them to give to you. So. Um, you see a plant achieving its genetic potential, achieving what it, what it's it's meant to do, and that plant is is going to provide that to you, so you can achieve your best as well. But um, yeah, chard, kale, things like that. Uh, parsley, I just like absolutely love parsley in the garden. Um, it's my favorite pesto. Uh, some parsley, maybe some basil mixed in there too in the winter. Um, uh, and, um, things like that celery, I don't know about the nutrient density of celery. It's got a lot of water in it, but it sure does make those soups good. <laughs> it really does. It really does. That's beautiful. Thank you, you so can much. Get the leaves off the outside edge of it. You don't have to do like the store where you pick the whole celery plant. You just peel the bigger leaves off the outside as, as you use it. And up here in the snow, the celery just grows. I mean, the uh, parsley grows back um, right, right out of the snow and stuff. It's, it's just crazy. Really beautiful. You know, Sasha, you had said earlier, I really loved what um, you had mentioned, that energy follows awareness. And like that statement is so totally definitive of the way that Amanda and Brandon uh, do their gardening. Like, you all are, you, you see something in your garden and then you're gonna put like this ton of energy into it. And if anybody out there hasn't checked out this couple's amazing transformational garden on a small amount of acreage, definitely do Kush Kirk, Garden of Greece. You guys are such a beautiful example of backyard regenerative medicine veggies. What's going on? What are you guys planting? What's important? What's up, fam? Oh. What's going on, everyone? <laughs> we're chilling. We're hanging out. We're doing good. Thanks for letting us on. Everyone says amazing things that just resonate so well with everything we do here. And uh, we're just, you know, I feel like just staying true to what is, uh, you know, pure and, and really mindful of a lot of intention, yeah, into everything we do. Yeah, uh, we definitely feel like what we've been doing for the past couple of years is what everybody is doing right now. We feel like we're kind of ahead of the curve, almost, in a sense, by getting in front of it and being able to help other people in our community that weren't ahead of it. So we're feeling so fortunate that we can actually be a catalyst for this movement. Yeah, totally. It's been really fun. And it's just like what I feel like is our human instinct is almost like what I feel. Um, you know, it's not work. It's not anything else except what we're meant to do. So, you know, that's that makes that really feels good when you when you get that deep feeling that some of us really do share, you know, that you just know it's all good. And what are we planting? I feel like we planted out a 50 foot of veggie hoop. Um, yeah, we, we did, did cauliflower and broccoli on the edges. We did, we interplanted some lettuce in between and spinach. And then we did peas and beans down a trellis in the center. Beets and carrots as well. Oh yeah, and some root vegetables on the interplanting as well in the little walkways. So that'll be really fun to see it all come to life. We just seeded that within the last like three weeks. Yeah, so. they're like just coming up right now. De-weeding it so we can tell who's who. <laughs> yeah. And, and then we're helping our neighbor. Um, he helped us and brought a tractor over, well, now four years ago and helped us build our hugoculture beds. Yeah. And a lot of people around here are total skeptics of what hugoculture can do. And it's been amazing to show people that it really works and it's really amazing to retain water and nutrients. And so four years later, he came knocking on our door and he's like, I'm ready to build some hugels and yeah. I want y'all's help. While so. everyone else is like kind of, you know, eating, like biting the bullet and, and you know, really have to come come to terms with like the pound price going down and the cost of like the amendments going up still and how do you survive and like sustainability is the way and like this is this, this whole thing that we're talking about is like 
if you want to, you know, in, in order to survive, you have to think correctly. And this is thinking correctly and long term. Um, so, and by thinking correctly, then you mean just not outsourcing, right? Finding right. Things on your property that you can use, and also during this time, utilizing other people's waste. A lot of people are yeah. throwing things out that are so so useful in a garden or in a compost. Like we were talking about noxious weeds. There are places where you can get paid to take weeds out to and they're amazing for yeah. compost super nutrient dense that's what i was going to say too is we built our whole garden pretty much off of uh biomass from just green material at first comp like you know simple jadem ferments uh yeah, we and, didn't have any animals. and you know then we got animals then we started acquiring like the biodynamic side of it and all of it coming together was like the you know it's all a key recipe um but it all started from just easy greens you know like if you do have a garden space and you know you have extra space that you don't even know what to do with or it's just like on the side of your walkways or whatever and start planting like a ton of comfrey and just like watch it just you know take over and then chop it all back and use a ton of that into composting you know and you'll build biomass piles that will be super tall and uh, then the worms eat them down into black gold and then that's really like you know how to build soil simply just like like little things like that and um i feel um where else was i going with that um uh yeah i don't know now that we're just doing it and we're surviving and people are noticing in town you know and like we talk to people and share the experience by telling them to come over all the time and walk in through the garden um and then they walk out feeling different they really don't understand there's like a vortex of this like matrix that kelly was kind of saying it's like you really can get sucked into something that is like really powerful here and uh we love sharing that with everyone and uh you know so it's not just cannabis it's it's a ton of food and you know it's in order to build that food storage um how anyone can really like you know grow a bunch of weed not anyone but you know a lot of us can grow a lot more weed than we could have back in the day and then uh, that's almost quite easy. I feel like the cool new thing might need to be like how to build that, like that pantry that Patricia has. And, uh, you know, that to me is badass. You know, that's, I agree. Yeah. I feel like this, I feel like this year is like the year of the root cellar and it's the year of the, the save the seeds. And it's just like, oh, wow, we got to, you know, tomatoes are not the easiest thing to seed, you know, and, and, and if you want to save a, a squash, it's, it has to take it, you know, an intentional you know, pollinating in the morning to do it proper, you know, you can let it go too, but. And, and you guys were talking about using your biomass and, and part of the DemPure, you know, to be a DemPure certified farmer, you have to be, you know, utilizing a lot of closed loops. And that's really what you're talking about. You're growing your own biomass, you're creating closed loops. Could you explain to people what a closed loop is because you all are such an unbelievable like beautiful uh, example of of closed loop farming and and what you all do are doing is amazing so. this the best way the best way and i got it perfectly is like when i literally you know found out about you guys and i looked at the back of the product label and i said oh it has you know all these comfrey nettle uh yarrow that you know all these things added up well it's like i just went out and got them that's closing the loop right there it's like i didn't need to buy the product more than you know the one time to kick start the garden type of thing and then you know letting all these things like rosemary and all these slow perennials still grow on the side is is that's closing the loop i think in my opinion is yeah finding what what the products are and then yeah just creating all of it now on site and you know yeah, and do you knowing feel like you've noticed it in the hash oh completely yeah i mean you know that's like a whole other side of it here as a, like garden of greece is is now you know breeding for hash plants and intentional like cultivation for resin production um for water hash extraction only uh, or dry sift extraction and that is you know that's the big picture that we're really seeing too is like the living soil uh, this real raw, pure soil. It's nothing that we're like special secret recipe. It's just the raw stuff that we find around. Um, that right there is really bringing out the true essence of the plant. And I feel like, you know, it's, um, that's really what we all need to kind of 
have like at least a base, you know, to go by, you know, and that's something, uh, it's just breeding is almost, it's, it's not, I think the worst thing to do like indoors, but it almost alters it where it's not as easy for, I think other people to work with stuff. And I think, you know, working with a living soil where rain, heat, sun, cold, all these things really battle on the seed. And that's what, you know, helps the next generation be a good sturdy generation where a lot of our veggies, you know, uh, plants have came from things like that. And uh, yeah, right. we live in kind of a harsh climate. We live at the a really low elevation on a really rocky piece of property that was washed out by a river a long time ago. So there's no topsoil. And so when we can find plants that can actually thrive here, you really want to pay attention and save those seeds because those plants are so resilient yeah. to where you're at, to that rain, to those cold nights, to those hot, intense days, um, all things that not all breeding is, you know, um, capable of taking it to that level. And so we really got to trust your local seed sources, you know, really get involved with people that are doing open pollination in your area. And it's amazing um, the resilience that those seeds have in comparison to just buying them from a huge online brand. Um, and it also brings you a lot closer to your community and local food sources you know what are other people in your area growing and what do they like to eat i really liked what daniel was saying earlier and completely agree grow what you eat that is the most important thing when it comes to having a garden space make a list of all your favorite foods go to the back of all your tea blends and look at what's in your tea blends go to the back of your supplements read all the herbs in your supplements those are the seeds you need to be putting in your garden because you're already ingesting them all the time and you don't know the source. And so that's really another important part. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. You guys are beautiful. Thanks. Um, and speaking of reading and seeds and, 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 and keeping these amazing varietals going, Kenny, Mount Baker Highway, What's going on? Thanks for hanging in there with us. I just want to just mention, you know, it's it's really beautiful uh, watching the mycelium come alive on your property and just getting little lion's manes and and all the stuff there. I'd love to hear what's happening on your property and what you're what you got going on right now. And I just wanted to add really quick, Kenny, is like the breeding that you've been doing for medicinal values, you know, and what people are getting out of you know, the seed stock and the varietals that you're creating and, and continuing is, is really awakening. It's healing people on such a deep level. So much deep gratitude for you and what you do. Hey, thank you guys. Uh, yeah, hey everybody, I'm Kenny. I'm from Washington, uh, up near Bellingham, just north of uh, Seattle, um, right, basically right on the Canadian border. And um, me and my sister run a farm called Eagle Trees and um, yeah, we've been, it's kind of crazy these days. Everything's shut down, you know, business has kind of come to a halt. And uh, I, what, I, what I was thinking about was like the most relevant thing for me right now is that like, I noticed everybody's having to take care of their kids. You know, the workforce is kind of gone. Even if you're, even if you have a job that, um, you know, is, is uh, deemed uh, essential. Um, you might not even be able to be there. And so I, I see a tendency in the, in the cannabis industry to go really big a lot. Like everybody really, a lot of people go real hard, a lot of infrastructure, um, and they might find their farm all of a sudden empty because people have to take care of their families and their loved ones, or they you know, don't feel comfortable going out. Um, something that uh, I thought I was just thinking about like, these farmers that are out there just all of a sudden nobody's there and they, they got to take care of the show it's spring right now you know uh things have to be planted and uh, uh so i was just thinking about things that um i've seen success for myself on my farm and um leaning into the natural cycle i think is something that we all really need to get back into and um on any kind of scale, small or large, um, you know, growing from seed like everybody's shared is, I think, the best thing that everybody can do, um, especially in the cannabis, uh, on the cannabis side. But um, 
one tool that that's really helped me on my farm this year was that we built a germination chamber and uh basically for us it's a room where we can we have tables and we can control the heat in a really low tech way you can make a box if you if you're really small in your house with a light bulb in it or a small heat mat um but uh, we just have a little oil heater, like electric oil heater in a room and it keeps it super warm and we can start our um, seeds in there. And as soon as they germinate, we can get them outside. But it, it's been helping us have a lot higher germination rates, just having the extra heat early on in the season. And we can get a rotation, like fill up the germ chamber. When we start seeing stuff, we can get them outside. Um, and yeah, in my, my opinion, if you're running your show alone or with, you know, the decreased uh, people just not not going through cuttings all the time, you know, keeping, you know, it's, it's just a lot of uh, lights and media and um, it's just one more thing to do when you should be taking care of your soil and, and making sure you, you're having your compost on the field and making sure everything is um, nutrient rich. Um, so the germination chambers, that, that's the first thing. Um, and that will allow you to not need lights. You can just move them into a greenhouse or out onto a shelf um, in a window um, or a cold frame. And um, cold frames can be really simple. It's just a box. You can take wood and build a box and put a window on it from a, a used you know, construction salvage store and um, and it'll change change the way you grow because you you won't be, uh, you know you won't have to pay the extra money right now to keep the lights on, and um, you can you can just get them out of your germination chamber right into the sun into the natural cycle, and um, that'll help you harden your plants off, and that's and hardening plants off especially with cannabis and and any gardening is, is really important in making sure they're used to the environment before you put them through uh, stress. Um, you know, events, I guess. Um, but yeah, um, I've been using uh, low hoops inside of my greenhouse as a way to start my seeds and um, my nursery plants um, stay warm. And, you know, it's super cooking. We have snowing today, but I have, you know, hundreds of feet of low hoop and, um, and, and, and they stay totally fine. So that's a, you know, hoop and a hoop. And it, it is a lot of plastic, but I, I um, use old um, plastic that ripped up from my greenhouse and you know, I cut it down into smaller sizes and I just keep using it. Um, and uh, if people are, you know, don't run a farm or they, they, they want to make a cold frame, like you can go to your local organic farmer and they're going to be uh, getting rid of these in spring potentially throughout the winter um, to put on fresh plastic when they get holes, a branch falls through the, the plastic or whatever. So there's always somebody trying to get rid of their greenhouse plastic and especially with cannabis farms just popping up everywhere in the, in the, the world, really. Um, there's more plastic than ever. And, um, and so I think that's, that's a really good resource that people need, yeah, need to knock on their neighbors, their door and, and say, Hey, you know, I got this to trade. Um, and, uh, yeah. Um, Brandon and Amanda were talking about, um, uh, local waste streams that you can utilize. Um, if you just find the farmers with aligning values in your area, you know, who, who's running the dairy around the organic dairy or who's running goats, you know, you can trade them for manure and um, you can trade them labor. Um, for us on our farm, we, uh, we work with a local organic mushroom farm called Cascadia Mushrooms and every Monday, I, I go to this farm and I, I just clean off the shelves and um, take that back to my house. And um, I just load up my truck and it's a lot of work. It's about a day a week when I factor in taking off mushroom, uh, the bags that some of the, the mushroom blocks are in, but um, it's such a huge resource As for my farm. I'll put a whole day in every week all year to um, be able to make my own compost and have a really rich fertile media um, to grow in. So talking to your, your local farmers is super important. You know, there's, everybody's got a baker in their family. Tell them to save the, the eggshells for you. Um, if you see somebody trimming trees, get those wood chips. Like if you see the people working on the highway trimming trees, like they're always chipping into the back. 
Um, and uh, I, I really liked uh, Alexis's uh, presentation on wild harvesting things because it's it's prime time to like start getting out there and getting nettles and horsetail and um, you know all kinds of stuff. Uh, so uh, yeah, and uh, you know people at their farms or in their gardens, like it's easier to make the amount of soil you need um, to start a garden, whether you're filling seed trays or small pots, it's really, if you start a worm bin where you put all your compost into it, or you start a compost pile, after, after a year, you'll, you'll be able to sift that, that compost out and get a nice, uh, a nice planting media. And that's what we've, we've started to do. And it actually turns out great. And uh, something that's really useful that I started with was just a, a frame that was a square on um, two sawhorses and we'd shovel the, um, the compost onto it and uh, on a half inch screen we'd shake it out and just use the fluffy stuff that fell below, toss the solids in the compost pile. And um, for, our, for our farm, we, we have a, like a, a, a recreational farm in Washington that we grow cannabis on and um, we do vegetables and other stuff as well. But, uh, We've moved up to a, a trommel, which is uh, it's spelled T R O M M E L. If you can't hear me, but uh, it's basically like a rotating screen on an electric motor, and it allowed like me and my uh, coworker Alex to sift like forty yards of compost in about two days, and it was just like the the nicest stuff to start seeds in ever. And um, all of the solids can go to the compost pile, or to ask, you can use it as mulch. Um, you know, there's a plethora of things you can do, but from a small compost pile, you'll get enough to fill your egg cartons or your seed trays or your boxes. Um, and uh, you can really do it very low cost. Um, yeah, I think that's that, that was kind of what I, I was thinking about sharing. Just like, how, how do you run your farm alone or with, you know, like Did you cut the compost that you use for your seedlings with anything? Because yeah. we kind of wonder we're wondering did i cut it with anything yeah like in anything like, like sand or like anything no so the majority of the compost that we make is uh those mushroom blocks so that's uh it's oh okay organic oh, milk, aerated. milk and it's uh sawdust so it's already very fine for the most part and um and we add we add hay to it and um and we, we're gonna we have we're, we got a cow we're trying to I want to get some alpacas do what you guys are doing I really like oh yeah because we've done it and then we were like we ended up not having the great because we ended up burning it was too strong and I was yeah. gonna say that before is like it's really good to always test um, whatever you're gonna oh, use okay. like even in your backyard if you're gonna start like your little backyard garden like go test your soil that's just sitting in your backyard because it might be like half decent um, the, you know the test won't lie and then have uh we had like done something like that here and just you know simply added a little bit of um <laughs> uh, dolomite lime to balance the ph because it had enough like npk just to kind of like ride it out for like small plants or whatever and we totally did it and it was good but our compost was too strong is pretty much where i was going with that when we tried to start our little seedlings we fried a lot of them yeah so i was wondering if you cut it with anything oh no no like i mean i guess the only thing we'd cut it with is um pot like pots from old from males from the year before so just that potting soil also is in the compost okay yeah so that okay that helps a lot you know that's what i was wondering too I was, that's what we we didn't add and then we realized oh shit we should have and then like you know had a good sifter and sift it all which i saw you do which was super badass um so yeah but good looks yeah Sometimes, yeah always living and learning i love it I know, yeah, our compost is actually slightly low in um, nitrogen, and so oh. uh, you know, I need to get some more animals on the farm. And Yeah, yeah, same. It's definitely, I think nitrogen is the hardest one to, I think, always find. I don't know why exactly, even though we have chickens and alpacas, but alpacas tend to give, I think, a little bit more phosphorus. Um, and then all the biomass that we've lot of done, it has a lot of phosphorus in, in like, mostly a lot of plants and potassiums are really high as well here. Potassium and phosphorus actually are really high here, but not a bad thing, I guess. I think an underutilized thing is the little mini baler, little mini balers that you can get. And you can bale up grasses or any kind of leaf bracken ferns. 
any kind of you know wild zone beside you can just bail it up and then you can use that as mulch and i think that's you know a really good thing and and also for yeah. compost. i know daniel uses that too uh bcs hand tractor it's so useful for yeah that's like one of my dreams is to get the the little mini baler um and I, th I think the BCS is great for really small farms because you can even get an electric motor. I'm kicking myself for not, but uh, like I have a trailer and I can just put all these like half gallon pots in it. I think I can do, it's like 120 perfectly in there. It's really fast and I can just move around my farm really easily. And uh, that, it, yeah, it saves a lot of time for me to have like a little, you know, carts on your farm, hand carts, whatever it takes to get like multiple you know, loads or trays or whatever you're doing around your farm, for sure. I love it. Thank you so much. And, you know, the last person to hear from tonight is Wade, and we really appreciate you waiting. And, um, you know, would love to hear from you um, on what's going on with you in, these, in, your, in your world these days. And, you know, you've helped bring CBD medicine to us and, and help create the Harlequin. And, and just love to hear what's on your mind. And Wade, I just wanted to say, just to, you know, anyone who doesn't know Wade Laughter from House of Harlequin, the, the incredible uh, justice that he's brought to the plant, the incredible voice that he's brought to the plant. You're so community minded. You've been such an incredible inspiration to CBD world and to true medicine from the plant. You've been just such a, a huge inspiration to us and so many. I just, I have so much gratitude for the work and the person that you are on this planet. Love Andrew. to hear about what's going on with you. Uh, uh, wow. Okay. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, we're uh, we're uh, uh, having the opportunity to harvest. Um, some of the plants that have gone to seed like mustard and nettle and um, uh, burdock. Uh, the presentation on herbs was really lovely this evening. Um, I've really been focused a lot on um, understanding what the, the virus that's running wild in our population, what that's about and uh, I think this evening's call is really um, uh, a beautiful example of uh, what it's going to take to make some of the changes that we're all trying to make happen. Um, I feel like regenerative practices uh, in agriculture make a lot of sense, but it, this evening's conversation was suggestive of regenerative practices within oneself. And uh, there's not a lot of conversation online about that. I don't get out online very often, but that to me is a really important part of the work that we're all doing is the interior conversation, if you will. Um, and that can apply, like, I really love the idea of grounding oneself by going out into the garden. And that's really what grounding is about, is being present with nature, in nature. And uh, nature happens in, even in densely populated cities. And I know we're all supposed to shelter in place. I feel real gratitude that my life is such that I can walk around on our little farm and not see anybody that I'm not sheltering in place with and, um, and have a chance to experience the St. John's wort that grows wild and the Oregon grape and the skull cap that's gone native now and the valerian and the comfrey and we're mostly a medicinal herb farm and there were a lot of herbs here when we got here um, so i've been taking it as a time of healing for myself and uh, our family uh, monica and i are uh, enjoying a lot of time together um, heidi and anthony are helping out quite a bit on the farm and it's and we're seeing really uh, good results. Our greenhouse is getting full of uh, seeds of all different sorts that are getting started. But because we don't, our local jurisdiction doesn't allow us to do commercial cannabis activity, only a few of those seeds or cuttings are cannabis. Um, 
I'm really, uh, I, a thing that I would like to share with anyone that cares to think about it this evening is the idea that uh, all of us sooner or later will be exposed to this virus. And the real question is, to what extent does one become infected by the virus and potentially lead into the uh, crisis state that results in death? Um, <clears throat> and as, as Terry was pointing out earlier, I think it's, it's what's true is we've been dealing with viruses since long before we were humans. And viruses likely play at a pretty essential part in the activity that we call life in our bodies. Uh, we're made up of many different organisms within our bodies. And it's, I think that's why it's important to walk in your garden, to be present in nature, because we are a part of all of that. And uh, for me, a really important, a thing I'd like you to hear is the idea that your immunity to this virus likely has a lot to do with the peace of mind and the openness of your heart to the nature that you're present with. And you can be present with your nature in what you eat by eating things that grow close to where you live. You can be present in nature by breathing the air, taking in deeply this air that we all share. We are all in this together. It's not like some people over there are gonna get sick and these people over here aren't gonna get sick. We'll all be exposed to this virus at some point. It has insane transmissibility. And a lot of people don't get very symptomatic, as you know, it's, uh, it's a funny virus that way. But what's, what I really hold to be true, again, is something important happens about your peace of mind and your openness of heart in the midst of all this madness, because the only place you can really find peace in this lovely world we live in is between your own ears and in your own heart. And then you can share it with those around you. And that's all I got this evening for the moment, unless there's questions. <laughs> and by the way, I really love this way. gathering of folks. Thank you. It's a wonderful evening. We all have time. It's important for us to just travel around. You know, we all have beautiful things we're thinking about. And, you know, we're involved in different things and we live in different areas. And, um, and I think it's time that we start looking at healing as, you know, something that's holistic. We have to touch all different realms of healing to be able to have the whole so that we can fully reach that that feeling of happiness and love marcus we haven't heard from you tonight what's going on what's been happening in your world we're so thankful that you're holding this space for us tonight how's your family doing and, and, and what's been going on well everything's going and trucking along i just turned 47 the other day and it was great i spent the whole day with my family my sons and my wife we walked up through the old growth forest in behind our house here in lions bay and we found all sorts of different medicinal mushrooms up there and we're just just spending a lot of time together and enjoying our time i absolutely enjoyed uh, everyone's talk today i really enjoyed uh Alexis going through the, uh, the, the edible plants. Um, I really love every time Terry talks, every, everything he seems to say is on point with uh, things that I, that I feel the same about. And uh, it was great to hear from, the, from uh, Daniel, the gardener up in Humboldt there. He sounded like he was fully aware of what he was doing and the knowledge was great. It's important right now, I think, to share this information, get people you know, it, and I don't think it's only just this sort of pandemic that we've found ourselves in, but cannabis for a very long time has been teaching me to sort of find the, the full melt in, in life, you know, whether it's full melt hash or full melt food or full melt, uh, you know, people that you want to hang out with, just setting that bar at, at that full melt level. And so I I really appreciated the panel tonight. Everyone, thank you for, for coming and sharing. I did end up crashing my internet halfway through at one point, but somehow it kept going and streamed live the whole time, even though I had no power and my internet was cut off completely. So 
props to Zoom and uh, props to, to everyone uh, on the panel tonight. And thanks, uh, Josh and Kelly, for putting together such a great, great group of people. It's, uh, it's really nice to be a part of. Give thanks, Marcus. Lots of love to you. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to go through a quick thing here really quick. And then we're going to um, pass, uh, you know, everyone on to the to the next to the rest of the evening mm -hmm. and to the chat. Maybe there's some questions that people want to stay on for too. So you know, moon planting. It's been a lot of chatter and talk. And since we're going to be doing these things every Thursday, I thought I would give the rundown of the week. Like. What's going on with the week? What do we need to be doing in our gardens? What do we need to be doing in our lives? What can we pay attention to? I think astrology is really important. The moon moves, you know, tides, it moves the ocean. We're made up of water. Plants are made up of water. Everything that's alive, you know, holds H2O. So I, I think that it's, it's really important. And we're starting to wax into the full moon. We're coming into the full moon in Libra. It's a really exciting time. Usually people feel sort of like the culmination of a lot of things that have been happening. You know, you've been brewing on things and you've been thinking about them. And as you wax into the full moon, we come into like actuality. And when we come into the actuality of a Libra moon, that's balance. We're, we're, we're seeing all of these different things and news and media, and we have this ability to come into full balance. So all of our thoughts can come into a beautiful fruition of full balance. And tomorrow um, and this afternoon moved into Leo moon, and that is a really good time. So today and tomorrow and a little bit in the morning on Saturday is a wonderful time to prune your fruit trees. You want to make sure to prune things that you don't want to grow. So if you have like blackberries that you want to use for a ferment or, or for a biomass, go ahead and cut your blackberries. They're not going to grow back very well on a Leo moon. Um, it's a wonderful time to, to, to prepare beds. Um, and if you uh, cut your apple trees, all those little prunings can be propagated really easy in the springtime if they're kept wet and in the shade. So you can propagate your fruit trees really and you want to right put now. them in a bucket of water because leo moon is not a good time to propagate so let's go ahead and cut those put them in, a, in, in water and then we are, are going to move on to virgo and virgo is sort of like you know not a great time for fertility so it's a great time to prepare all, all of your em your food preparation storage your gardening planning draw up plans that's going to move right into Monday, and then we're going to we're going to head into Le Libra, and Libra is the full moon. This is a wonderful time. And all of your pollinator um, flowers, Libra is a great time for flowers. So if we want to be planting cannabis flowers, and we're really going for this big, chunky, high yielding cannabis, Libra is a wonderful time. And right on that full moon, it's awesome. And then moving right into Wednesday, we're going to be going into uh, Scorpio. And Scorpio moon is a wonderful time to plant veggies, fruits, your melons, tomatoes. It's a great transplanting time. So if you have plants, you know, for, for Monday that are transplants, hold off on those cannabis plants until Wednesday. And then we'll be giving you your update for next Thursday and the week after that. So happy planting, everybody. And that's the, that's the rundown for our astrology for the week. And the one thing that um, I was uh, wanting to suggest to people is to do, um, you know, to make a list of all the plants that you have on your property or maybe the animals or the insects you have. And today, during our day of, of uh, being in the house and, and taking care of the garden, we made a list of all the birds. So I'm gonna give you a quick list of all the birds that we have on our property. In BC, so, right now. <laughs> um, we have the junco, the black cap chickadee, the chestnut back chickadee, the robin, the varied thrush. Mm -hmm. We have whiskey jacks that come down from the top of the mountains. We have stellar's jays, which are amazing and have the big caps. We have the winter wren, which is mostly here in the winter. And we have the wax wing. The swallows are coming back too. We have these little beautiful little yellow pine siskins. 
we have the pileated woodpeckers, these giant red woodpeckers, which are like the biggest woodpeckers in the world. And when you hit them, when they hit on a tree, it's like, don't, 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 don't. It's just amazing. And you can sit underneath the tree where they're pecking and it's just really, it's really fun to do. I like it a lot. We have beautiful flickers, amazing downy woodpeckers. We have wild turkeys, little snow buntings, incredible ravens, white winged crossbills, amazing goshawks, like two feet tall, giant goshawks. They eat our chickens. They're scary, they're scary. We have bald eagles and golden eagles that fly around the, uh, above our property. We have little house finches, little beautiful Western tanagers. And I would like to just really say we have incredible owls and the barred owls lately in our area are absolutely phenomenal. And Every they make night. a sound that says, and it sounds way cooler than that. <laughs> way, because it's like from cooler. the bowels way of the cooler. owl it's like coming through the forest and we'll go on like a 25 minute walk down the road and At this night. barred owl will follow us and we'll be talking this hoo 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 and they'll be coming <laughs> back at us and it's just like the best i have goosebumps thinking about these owls and then we have the saw wet owl the pygmy owl the screech owl and every once in a while a mallard comes to our pond <laughs> and that's it and we really love you guys. And maybe everyone can tell us where they can find you and follow you on your journey. Maybe Terry, you can tell us where people can find you and you can tell us about, uh, you know, all of the, the schools and the herbal medicines that you work with. Well, the easiest place to find me is um, wildrosecollege.com or you can find me at drterrywillard.com. Those are my two locations. Um, we have a a large number of online courses these days. Uh, actually, in the month of April, guess what? We're doing our, our cannabis startup. So we're doing a, a new cannabis course for healthcare providers so they can get a more educated in this area because it's the best cabin fever thing that we can do for people being isolated. And of course, we've got our, our 420 coming up here uh, for special pricing. But we have whole programs in herbal medicine, yes. <laughs> We, we have anything from single day herb courses to practical herbalist, master herbalist, clinical herbalist. And we do have people you can apprentice with all across North America so you can work with real clinicians. Um, we'd be very lucky to do that. But uh, that's basic my affiliations. I'm going to say Alexandra. Alexandra is alexandraloophole.com. Uh, she's online right now teaching courses. She's doing a, a 21 day meditation where the guided meditation or guided journey where she does every at eight o'clock or 8.30 in the morning and 8.30 at night uh, Pacific Standard Time. She's taking people on journeys and she's also doing really a lot of gardening courses right now. Quite a bit of them for free and some online. Um, as step programs. And she's also walking people through all the various um, plantings of the day with their Instagram feed. So that's basically us in our world. Next. <laughs> Alas, we're... I'm gonna go. Uh, Patricia and Forrest and... All the people on the farm who help us, um, Sunroots Farm. You can find us at sunrootsfarm.com and you can find us on Instagram at Sunroots Farm. That's you with for the sun. Nice chatting with you all. Thank you for letting me be here. It's an honor. Kenny. Yo, hey, hey, I'm Kenny. Um, my Instagram is uh, Mount Baker Highway, and my sister Jessie, um, her Instagram is uh, Eagle Trees Farm. And um, yeah, thanks for having me on tonight, you guys. Alexis, how can people find you? Sure. Um, yeah, we're Rebel Roots Herb Farm. Um, my wife uh, ships, we ship herbs um, that we grow here on the farm and some others that we bring in all over through mail. Uh, so it's rebelrootsherbfarm.com. And then um, our cannabis stuff, we have an online growing course that's starting. Uh, we ran for the first time last year. It's starting, it's starting basically in, in another few weeks. Um, that's Organic Grow Canada. 
uh, com, and then uh, for our wildlife tracking stuff and kind of foraging, canoe tripping, it's uh, earthtracks.ca. So cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Wade. Um, yeah, uh, there's a website that's years old and out of date at houseofharlequin.org. That's H O U S E. Um, there's a uh, Instagram and Facebook at H A U S of Harlequin and, um, and yeah, come to cannabis events in Northern California back when we, when we start having them again. <laughs> well, do. Um, well, do. And yeah, thank you guys. A uh, real pleasure and a real treat. Thank you. Brandon and Amanda, how can people find y'all? What y'all are doing? If you can find us, we're lost in the woods. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we're, <laughs> you can just find us on probably on Instagram. I'm Kush Kirk. And mine's Amanda Reed W. <clears throat> and yeah, we're just Garden of Greece in Southern Oregon. If you're in this area, always hit us up. We're always welcoming people. And we're building a sauna this week. We're building sauna. <laughs> So that's our project this week. So everybody come and hang out with us. <laughs> and remember, it's 420 all month. Yes. All year. 400 Let's days. Just remember that. That's important. We're building and the before, ultimate hot <laughs> Yeah. And before everybody leaves, I just, um, you know, wanted to speak from my heart. Here we are again with the most beautiful, amazing Dem Pure Collective. This is a group of people who are passionate about regenerative earth, regenerative mind, healthy mind, body, and soil. You all have had me in tears almost this whole time. I feel so blessed to have you all in my life. We are worldwide. And, you know, I've always said each one of us is a drop of water, and together we are a flood. And here we are, you know, together in isolation you know, still creating magic. Um, you, you just, you make you want to be a better person. I'm so thankful for you all um, tonight. Thank you. And two, two seconds, our beautiful dog passed away today and it was one of the hardest days ever. So I would love it if everyone could just give love to baby doggy, <laughs> Lola, our amazing dog. And, and and what an opportunity, um, you know, she died at home. And I just wanted to say how powerful birth and death are in our lives. And it's been taken away from us so often. And when we get to experience birth at home or we get to experience birth in, in a woman's power, wherever she is in a hospital on her own terms, or a being being able to die or our family being able to die on our own terms. It connects us on a level that just goes so deep. And I'm just so, I'm so thankful for that. And, and I just wanted to remind everybody that, you know, the importance of, of our humanity. Thank you all for being here tonight. Well said. Give love. Love. Give love. Like man all the love thanks for having us and good night mm. love you fam <laughs>